good morning and good afternoon, depending on uh, which part of the world you are. Welcome to this uh, free congress uh, workshop on palliative radiotherapy conducted as part of the annual academic sessions of the Sri Lanka College of Oncologists. Uh, on behalf of the SLCO, I extend a warm welcome to all delegates and faculty. This session, for this session, we have a very distinguished uh, panel of faculty spanning three continents, led by Professor Peter Hoskin, who needs no introduction to the clinical oncology community. He is the professor of clinical oncology at the University of Manchester. And in addition, he is a consultant clinical oncologist at the Mount Vernon Cancer Center and at the Christie Hospital as well. He has over 500, more than 500 publications, more than a dozen clinical trials, including several uh, in palliative radiotherapy itself. And he has also authored more than a do dozen textbooks, including the most famous uh, external beam radiotherapy textbook, which is uh, well read by trainees all over the world. Also joining from the University of Manchester is Professor Ananya Chowdhury. She's a, a professor of clinical oncology and a consultant clinical oncologist at the Christie Hospital, specializing in genitourinary cancers. She is also the co-group leader of the Translational Radiobiology Group of the University of Manchester. She has over 100 publications to her credit, and uh, until very recently, she was the senior editor of the International Journal of uh, Radiation Oncology, Biology, and Physics. We also have Dr. Robin pa uh, Portner, specialist registrar at the Christie Hospital, joining in. He leads the palliative radiotherapy service at the Christie Hospital, and we are very grateful for him for him joining in to give us a fresh perspective on palliative radiotherapy. Joining us from Perth, Australia is Dr. Sampath Kondasinghe, consultant palliative care physician. Uh, Sampath graduated from the University of Colombo and then migrated to Australia and is now a specialist in palliative care. He has visited Sri Lanka several times and uh, collaborated with us extensively with our palliative uh, care programs. From Sri Lanka, we have our very own Dr. Krishanti Rajasurya, joining in from the Teaching Hospital of Jaffna. Uh, she is a senior consultant oncologist, a fellow of the Royal uh, Australian uh, College of uh, Radiologists. She has worked in several international cancer centers, including the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Australia. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Naduni Imbulgoda, also a consultant oncologist uh, from the uh, District General Hospital of Vaunia. She's a fellow of the Royal College of Radiologists and has and undertook her fellowship at the Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. So to start proceedings, uh, I would invite Dr. Sampath Kondasinghe for his, uh, to deliver his talk on radiotherapy for symptom relief, the palliative care physician's viewpoint. My topic today is to discuss about the palliative care physician's viewpoint on the radiotherapy for symptom relief. Uh, this discussion um, unfolds around um, how to provide optimal care for our patients as a collaboration between our two specialties. This topic is mainly a practical uh, practical discussion rather than any theoretical uh, talk or uh, being a, a research based talk. Majority of this uh, brief discussion uh, unfolds around how the radiation oncologist can help palliative care uh, specialists to provide maximum care. So on the other hand, how you can help palliative care consultants or palliative care specialists to provide maximum care. Towards the end of the discussion, I'm going to discuss about how our specialty or palliative care can help the radiation oncologist to provide better care to your patient. 
before going to the next step of the discussion, I just briefly wanted to uh, discuss uh, the two healthcare systems, the similarities and differences, uh, so that we can see the similarities uh, in the healthcare systems and maximize the care for our patients. So. The, the, the flowchart in the middle of the uh, slide describes the Australia and New Zealand healthcare system. So, um, when we get the referrals from, uh, for the patients, it's primarily through a general practitioner because the the primary care responsibilities are always with the general practitioner. Um, so we act as uh, the primary specialty uh, to coordinate the care at the, uh, the palliative stage of the patient's life. I was trying to um, compare that system with the Sri Lankan setting. I would say the primary care providers are um, private practice uh, doctors, uh, ma mainly after us private practice doctors um, in um, throughout the country, same as if the patient present to the hospitals, um, they in the larger hospital, this could be uh, physicians or any other subspecialties. Um, at the same time, the when you go to the rural setting, it could be district medical officers or uh, any hospitals, uh, senior house officers can be your primary care provider in Sri Lankan setting. So you will be getting the referrals uh, as the primary specialist uh, from these above mentioned specialties. Um, so if your, refer your referral will be much more refined if you disperse the education to your primary care referrals. As I discussed before or outlined before, uh, the first part of this discussion is uh, about when do we need your help. Um, as a palliative care physicians, um, one of our major jobs is to control patient symptoms. So we seek your help uh, to control patient symptoms. Um, patient symptoms, most of our junior doctors tend to think the help for radio help from the radiotherapy is primarily for pain control. Yes, I understand the pain control uh, with the palliative radiotherapy plays a major part, but equally I seek your help for control of bleeding, airway blockage, and spinal uh, or neurological compromise. Let's talk about the radiotherapy use uh, in pain management in our practice. Um, during this discussion, I'm outlining uh, the benefits and obstacles. Uh, in the benefits section, I'm going to talk about what is working at the moment. And in the obstacles section, uh, what uh, I'm going to discuss what is need to be improved. Um, the main benefit, if I were to use the radiotherapy for the pain palliation, uh, is the minimum, the need, less need of the systemic medications. When I mention the systemic medications, um, it relates to opioids, cannabinoid, uh, non-steroidals, or steroid medications. For example, if we were to, uh, if uh, our collaboration or the help of the radiation oncologist if we were to deliver the ra uh, palliative radiotherapy to control pain at the right time, we are able to minimize the use of opioid uh, or gabinoids, hence minimizing the adverse effects like sedation or um, if we were to uh, minimize the use of steroids or non-steroidal medications, we can reduce the gastrointestinal side effects. Um, all these add up towards the quality of life. For example, um, if uh, the pain is well controlled, the patient will be less sedated and he, will, he or she will have a better quality of life. Um, and they need to, uh, and they can less rely on the systemic medications.
What is not working at the moment? Um, I find the, the lack of preparation for the treatment or adverse effects is the main obstacle at the moment. Uh, I will give a uh, small example um, uh, for you to understand. For example, if the patient is coming from a distance site to your radiation oncology delivery place, a uh, patient will come all the way and realize that patient is going to lie on a linear accelerator while having the severe bone pain. At the same time, patient could be having red and neck radiation and the patient will come and realize that patient is really claustrophobic. So if you are referring doctors, for example, as I described in the previous slide, if uh, your district medical officers or general, uh, general medicine doctors are well aware of these side effects, they can help you to disperse that knowledge to the patient so that patient is well aware of what's, uh, what he or she is looking for. Um, at the same time, if that knowledge is dispersed to the palliative care doctors, uh, especially I feel this knowledge is lacking in our trainees, our training registrars even. Um, so what, um, what we can do is if this patient is lying on a linear accelerator in pain, we can use patient control analgesia. So sometimes uh, before sending the patient for radiotherapy, I attach the patient for a, a patient control analgesia device so he, she, he or she can use the analgesia before lying on the bed. Um, at the same time, if the patient is claustrophobic, uh, we usually use some of the benzodiazepines uh, before going for the treatment. Uh, the next trouble we always face is the lack of coordination, especially when the patient does not have a long enough time or longer life expectancy. So most of these patients we know uh, for at least few months before these uh, palliative radiotherapy referrals. Um, so we can help the, uh, the radiation oncologists to give you an idea about uh, the patient's life expectancy with regards to how uh, quickly this patient is functionally deteriorating, um, especially if the patient has uh, only short weeks of life expectancy. So you radiation oncologists can be kind enough to provide shorter uh, duration of treatment or high fractionated treatment uh, uh, for the uh, these patients. Um, at the same time, the other problem I realized uh, we always face is the lack of knowledge about correct timing. It can go either way. Sometimes most of our doctors wait too late so that they are, um, they are in severe pain, almost uh, toxic with medications before sending to radiotherapy. Uh, and by then patient has suffered long enough and most likely uh, the uh, the patient will not even be, will be able to tolerate or get the uh, will not have in adequate time to get the benefit of the radiotherapy. On the other hand, some of the doctors I have realized they are trying to refer to our radiation oncologist without uh, even having symptoms. For example, prostate cancer patient who just came out from the PET scan uh, found to have multiple asymptomatic bone metastasis. I mentioned, as I mentioned, the asymptomatic bone metastasis. Soon after they have seen that PET scan, uh, they try to send it to the radiation oncologist even without symptoms. So we, what, what is important from this section of the talk is um, the as radiation oncologist or uh, trainees, it will be important uh, to disperse your knowledge to the 
uh, the generalist working in your hospital and area so that they will send you the referrals at the right timing uh, hence patients will benefit in the right way the next indication we refer palliative care patients for additional oncologist help is bleeding so the bleeding can vary from insignificant cutaneous or skin bleeding which uh, we will get the benefit of the, uh, at the time of dressing changes because of the less bleeding to the extent of the catastrophic uh, lung or gastrointestinal bleeding so what is what are the benefits of the radiation therapy I see uh, from the uh, from the palliative radiation to the bleeding uh, lesions. The main uh, the benefit I see is patients' improvement in the quality of life. Primarily, patient patient not only the patient family and the healthcare providers will have less fear about this bleeding, especially if you are talking about the, uh, the major gastrointestinal or uh, the, uh, the airway bleeding. Um, we, we, we can, if we can minimize these bleeding manifestations, uh, patients will have less fear, hence a good quality of life uh, as a result. At the same time, as the staff or to the patients, if you talk about uh, um, the skin bleeding manifestation, the nurses will benefit uh, of less dressing changes um, and the patient will have the less trouble of fearing about the bleeding from every time you have the dressing changes. If you talk about the major bleeds, um, the, uh, if you talk about the gastrointestinal lesions or the uh, airway lesions, if you uh, provide the radiotherapy, we are, um, our, our staff uh, and the patients are very grateful because they will need less transfusions um, and, uh, and less hospital admissions for transfusions. Um, if you think about any bladder lesions, uh, if you are providing uh, radiotherapy for the uh, stop uh, minimizing the bleeding, uh, patients will have less catheter blockages or less catheter changes or less bladder irrigation to uh, for the uh, hematuria. So these are all the measures which are done to improve quality of life, which we really appreciate your help. What is the, what is, what are the obstacles uh, we face when we are sending a patient for uh, radiotherapy for bleeding? Um, our staff most of the time do not have the knowledge about correct timing, because if you are waiting uh, upper airway lesion very close to a major pulmonary blood vessel if you're waiting for that lesion to bleed um, by then it will be a troublesome time already compromised airway most likely cardiovascularly compromised as well you will not have a chance to give effective radiotherapy so if our staff knows uh, the correct timing to refer to you they will once they see a lesion closer to the major blood vessels and they clinically assess it is a high chance of bleeding they will refer the uh, patient to you all the issues are discussed with the bleeding are valid for airway blockage as well but the major benefit is if you deliver the the radiotherapy at the right timing you will need less tainting um, and and less use of oxygen uh, because yeah, the patient's airway can be secured early enough 
When we talk about oxygen, I understand in Sri Lankan setting, community oxygen supply is limited and a costly exercise. We could provide these patients uh, palliative radiotherapy early enough. These episodes of airway blockage can be minimized, hence the need for oxygen can be minimized as well. Um, at the same time, um, the hospital admission rate and the need for the respiratory doctors to put the stenting to the airway will be minimized as well. These are all considered as the quality of life measures. What, are, what is not working? Again, it is at, uh, picking the correct timing. Um, because if you wait too late and um, you almost go to the dilemma the respiratory doctors are scared to put the stent uh, and the radiation oncology doctors do not have a patient stable enough to provide the radiotherapy um, so if you provide the radiotherapy early enough we can uh, minimize that dilemma of whether we have to put the stent or not in case if you head towards that dilemma of who is going first, um, palliative care doctors are all, always happy to assess the patients functionally and coordinate the care between radiation oncology and the, uh, the respiratory medicine to coordinate about the stenting and the radiotherapy. The last topic I am going to discuss is uh, the neurological compromise. When we mention the neurological compromise, you almost think we are talking about only about the spinal cord compression. Um, spinal cord compression is a major issue, but I'm going to uh, mention about the other neurological compromise as well. Major plexus compromise such as brachial plexus compromise and the spinal cord compression are sometimes major indications we are seeking your help. If we provide the radiotherapy to these patients, we see the patient's mobility is uh, preserved and then uh, we, see we need the help of the physiotherapy and occupational therapy less and um, we need the fusosurgical surgical interventions less. So preserving this patient's uh, Neuro, uh, uh, neurological um, integrity will help the quality of life. What troubles do we have? Again, it is a timing issue. If we identify a patient who has the impending spinal cord compression, we do not need to wait until it completely uh, compresses the spine. So. Um, I always promote our, the junior doctors to refer the patients when we identify the impending lesion despite not having any hard neurology. Almost if you have a hard neurology uh, in this patient, it is quite late uh, for the referral. Um, so we, um, we seek your help. If we, need, if we realize any lesion is going to uh, compress on the spinal cord, we will ask your help to provide the immediate radiotherapy. Last part of my discussion is all about how palliative care can help radiation oncologists. Um, the, the first bit we can help with the radiation oncologist is for the prognostication in the, this latter part of their life. Uh, we understand the radiation oncologists or in Sri Lanka clinical oncologists are very well trained to prognosticate the patients. But uh, towards the palliative phase of their life, uh, they are uh, functional as uh, Functional assessment plays a paramount role in prognostication. As I previously mentioned, these patients are known to palliative care for a couple of months at least, and we 
uh, usually know how rapidly they are progressing. If these patients are rapidly progressing and having a shorter life expectancy, we can easily guide the radiation oncologist to uh, request uh, the shorter course of radiotherapy. So uh, the majority of the time patient can spend quality time with the, uh, patient, uh, the patient's family rather than spending in the hospital setting. At the same time, if this patient has a short life expectancy, he or she can use lesser time to travel to hospital and lesser transportation and lesser um, uh, more time spent uh, at home. At the same time, we can help uh, the, the radiation oncologist to clarify goals of treatment. Basically, whether this patient is having radiotherapy to uh, the minimize the disease progression versus whether this patient is having radiotherapy purely for pain control. These goals of care discussions are part and parcel of your day, our daily practice. So yeah, I, I ask uh, the radiation oncologist to get our help if uh, they need. Uh, this will be important if we, if the audience has any uh, registrars who are coming uh, for the overseas training. So if we work in collaboration, um, we you can easily ask our help to clarify the goals of care for these patients. Um, at, as I mentioned before, uh, you can always use us to disperse your knowledge to the patient. So rather than patient coming all the way to see you in your clinic, we can see the patients in uh, in community setting or in the uh, our ward admitted patients. We can discuss all these issues before coming to see you. Adverse effect and the logistic of the delivery of radiotherapy. And last but not least, we can always help to manage the adverse effects of the radiotherapy, especially if the patients are having a flare-up of symptoms related to radiotherapy, or if the patient is having any gastrointestinal or any other adverse effects related to the proximity of the radiotherapy, we can always help to manage them. In summary, our two specialties can work together towards providing better patient care. As radiation oncologists always uh, prefer uh, some evidence, I have provided some research articles, some of uh, reasonable new, uh, to provide how much knowledge uh, is uh, needed for the primary care doctors to provide better care and to provide better referrals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kundasinga, for that very uh, informative talk and for your perspectives on palliative radiotherapy as a palliative care physician. We now move on to the first block of case discussions, uh, which will be presented by uh, Dr. Robin Portner. Uh, uh, panel uh, will join uh, Professor Hoskin, Professor Chowdhury, uh, um, Dr. Raj Suri, and Dr. Imbulgoda will be joining in as well. And you can interact with, uh, this is meant to be an interactive session as far as possible. So using your, the QA tool, um, you can ask questions as we discuss uh, these cases, and it will be very helpful to get your perspective as well. So I would strongly encourage all our delegates to uh, give their views and questions as we discuss these cases. So I would now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Robin Portner to lead uh, the first block of case discussions. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, shall I just share my screen then? Uh, has that worked? Yes, Robin, we can see the uh, see your slides. Okay, great, great. Uh, so, good morning. Yeah, thank you for inviting me for um, to talk. So, I've got uh, seven presentations 
um, seven cases. Uh, the first four actually cases that I've seen recently. Um, uh, so apologies there. The, the first four are actually all lung cases, but there's still some interesting uh, aspects to them. So the first case uh, is a 73-year-old male. Um, he's got no past medical history and certainly not a, a diagnosis of cancer. Previously fit and well, independent uh, performance status zero. Um, but over the pre um, preceding three months, he had um, back pain. But then over two weeks, just deteriorated and he actually his, um, it started to affect his mobility. So he presented to A&E. When they examined him, they found um, that he had power of three out of five in both legs. Um, they also did uh, did urgent COVID swabs as well, as just practiced at the moment in the UK, and he came back as positive of, of COVID. So he had an urgent MRI scan, um, which as, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can see. Yes, great. So there's, um, there's a core compression at T2, uh, and actually on the report they said there was a soft tissue mass around T2, and you can see it uh, anteriorly here. Um, at, on the same Day, he also had a CT chest abdopelvis as well, um, which has shown um, a large soft tissue mass um, in the, the posterior mediastinum up here, um, and that was actually invading into the into the cord. So it wasn't a, a bone metastasis; it was actually a soft tissue tissue lesion. Um, there were also some mediastinal lymph nodes as well. Um, so initially, he was referred urgently to the spinal surgeon for a decompression. Um, but as, um, as he had COVID, he, he actually became quite unstable uh, and they, they thought that he wasn't a surgical candidate. Um, so then he was discussed here, um, at the Christie um, with our metastatic core compression team. Um, and although we thought this was a, um, a lung cancer, we were worried that this might be a small cell lung cancer, and we, uh, in which case we'd, we'd offer chemotherapy rather than uh, radiotherapy. So we, um, we request an urgent e-bus which did confirm uh, an adenocarcinoma of the lung. So his staging, just ba based on the CT chest of the pelvis, um, he didn't have any metastatic disease, but it was a T4 lesion, N2, M0. Um, so he's referred for, for radiotherapy. So, um, this is so, so I guess we'd start off by asking really what, um, what we need to cover with our radiotherapy, whether we just cover the core compression and then aim for some, some further treatment later, um, or whether we try to encompass it all. Um, bear in mind that he had neurology and he was, um, he was quite unwell with his COVID as well. Um, and also consider what dose and fractionation and what beam arrangement. So I'll open that up to Okay, the group. so um... I think uh, the audience can now interact through the QA tool. Uh, if you can just uh, type in what you think very briefly, uh, what you think should be the field and uh, the dose and fractionation and beam arrangement. Uh, while uh, we give some time for the audience, uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Krishanti Rajasuriya yeah. what she thinks about, uh, you know, do we cover the, just the, uh, cord compression bit, or do we cover the whole mass? Uh, Kushanti. Okay, I think uh, there is some connectivity issue. Uh, uh, Professor Chowdhury, what do you think about this case? Um, so I think so. I think the important things here for this um, case are actually his um, comorbidity. Yeah. So he is poorly with COVID. He's clearly not fit for decompression, which would be which would be more ideal in this case. And therefore, I think any treatment we give has to be very mindful of that. I think at the same time, we have one chance to treat this man's disease and get some local control and help his symptoms. So I would suggest that we make everything as simple as possible. We encompass as much disease as we can. And from the scans, I think it should be um, covered by a relatively small field. Um, and I would give eight gray as a single fraction and um, oppose fields in something that is fairly straightforward to do. Nothing too fancy for me.
Uh, Professor Hoskin, uh, so I think, so based on the SCORE trial, you single dose ra radiotherapy for uh, spinal cord compression. Do you think uh, this is a good fit for uh, that regimen? Well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, I think, as Professor Chowdhury said, it really depends on the general state of the patient. Um, this patient has COVID. I'd want to know how severe that was, whether he had pulmonary complications, renal complications. Um, he has a very advanced adenocarcinoma of the lung, so his life expectancy is um, going to be really quite limited. And therefore, we're looking at palliation. Um, He's had symptoms for 72 hours, so there may be limited options for regaining neurological function. Uh, clearly, 8 gray is not going to have a big impact on a large mass like that. Uh, it would have pain-relieving properties, but I think that would be the limit of what one would expect from um, treatment, really. And indeed, I think there is a case for considering whether active treatment is even appropriate in this case. Okay. Yeah, sh sh shall I show you what we, yeah, we did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. So, uh, so we aimed to give actually tw uh, 20 and five, um, but then when he, when he came to radiotherapy, we actually had to change it to a single fracture because he really was quite un unwell with this COVID. Um, so, um, so instead of just treating the, the T2, we, we tried to cover the, um, the whole um, soft tissue mass that you can see is, is contoured here in, in green with, a, um, with an expansion. Um, and as uh, Professor Chowdhury said, um, we treated this with a parallel pair um, because the, the disease came quite anterior. Um, so he, he had a single fracture of radiotherapy and, uh, and sadly, actually, he, he passed away from his is COVID. So, um, so um, Robin, do you think it was worth giving him the radiotherapy with hindsight, going back to what Professor Hoskins said? In this with particular case, would we have been better not treating him? So, so bear in mind that he was previously very, very fit with no co comorbidities and he had, and the reason why he was unwell was, was a reverse, reversible, well, not well, it was a was an infection that that we were hoping that he would make a full recovery. So um, I think they they tried to to I think it was appropriate to to treat yes, but then um, certainly not for the um, for the twenty twenty gray. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't. He never got any benefit from it. So just a quick question regarding... If he was to recover uh, from his, his COVID, then yeah. his, uh, his, camp, so for his COVID core patients, compression uh, would, would leave him paralyzed. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, just a quick question. For COVID patients uh, treated with radiotherapy... Should we go to the uh, next case? For, can you hear me, Robin? I'll put the next oh, case yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick question. Yeah. So for COVID patients... Uh, Treated with uh, radiotherapy, what, what additional precautions do you, do you use? Do you allocate a separate machine or is it, uh, how, how, how does it happen? Yeah. So, so now we're, we're trying to just treat them at the end of the day, uh, okay. trying to minimize uh, uh, any contact with other patients. But if they're well enough, and, and we have a lot of asymptomatic COVID patients uh, coming through the department and you wouldn't want to compromise their, their radiotherapy. So we're... Um, uh, all the the staff are using full PPE for for all patients anyway. So, um, but with with COVID, they're just treated at different different time of day and just to yeah. minimise any exposure. Yeah, um, certainly the first wave of COVID. I think we um, all our palliative pa um, patients were uh, very low priority, and a lot of the patients ended up without treatment. So second case uh, is another lung cancer. This is a 67-year-old lady uh, with a newly diagnosed extensive small cell lung cancer with bony mets. Um, she was seen by the medical oncologist and discussed chemotherapy, but as her um, prognosis was overall quite poor, um, she declined chemotherapy. Um, but she was really troubled with neck pain and, sh uh, and left shoulder pain. She didn't have any respiratory symptoms, um, but performance status overall too. 
So she was referred to us for some uh, radiotherapy to her neck and to her shoulder. So here's an MRI of her spine, uh, where there's a, a what was it C C6 uh, vertebral met. Uh, there's also a, um, a met lower down a T T7, um, and I know it. I hope you can appreciate. It. There's seems to be disease there and the um, scapula, the glenoid process there as well. Um, so that was what she was referred for. But then I think just bear in mind what her, her um, chest, chest X-ray shows a right-sided um, apical lesion there. Um, and that's quite, quite close to where, to where the um, C6 was. So uh, and it was quite a large extensive mass, uh, eight centimeters in the right upper lobe. So she has really, she has four sites of disease. Um, the lung primary, the C7 uh, met, that's, that's causing her pain, scapular met, uh, and the T, T6 vertebral met. Um, so, I, so the first question to, to the group is really, what's, uh, what's the priority to, to treat and, what, uh, and to cover? Uh, and then how is treating what you treat now, how is that gonna have any impact on, on future treatment? Uh, and will that really change, change what you try to encompass? Okay, so uh, yes, so uh, I would once again uh, invite the audience to comment through the uh, through the QA tool. Um, while we do that, um, uh, Doctor Imbulgora, could you just uh, give your thoughts on this? Is a patient with multiple meds, and what are the priority regions to? Priority volumes, and what what do we need to treat? Naduni, could be my first priority, so I'll take. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you yeah. now. Yeah. Can? All right. So uh, for me, the the two vertebral mets would be my. Uh, major priority. The C7 would be the first one and the lung lesion is quite close to that so I'll encompass that as well. Um, I would need to sort of uh, have a think of whether I'll include the other the only one as well but I think uh, if you treat in one field everything together uh, something like 20 and 5 would, uh, uh, would be okay. I thought uh, shoulder pain was the issue. Yeah, shoulder pain and neck pain. Okay. Um, so do we treat only the scapula before sick because uh, she's symptomatic towards the scapula, or do we treat the rest of the spinal disease and the primary tumor as well? Um, I would go for the C7 and the bone lesion, uh, the, the, the scapula bit. Um, T1, I need to have a look at the field and see how big it is. If it's encompassable, I would, but if it's too big, I'll just leave it. Okay, uh, so Krishanti, you would uh, just treat the scapula, is it? Or? No, I would uh, uh, treat the spinal as well because there is a risk of cord compression. So I would, I would definitely treat the C7 and the uh, T1 uh, deposits as well because it's uh, uh, especially the T1, it's very posterior the deposit and it, it can always impinge on the cord. So again, I will put my fields and see whether everything can be encompassed in one radiation field because we are only giving 20 in 5 so that, uh, and, uh, so that we avoid the issue of overlap later on. So what about the scapula? Do you think that needs treatment now or are you going to... Uh... It it's a more symptomatic site, I thought, Robin. Okay. Yes. Right. So that means okay. so the primary on the left side or the right side? The the scapula on the left side, uh the lung lesion was on the right side. Okay. okay. So that yeah. field might be too big. Okay. Yeah. Uh so Robin, I think you can tell us what oh, sorry, method. yeah. Yeah, so I'll... and then a different uh two oblique fields for the uh scapula, maybe okay. two different fields. So two oblique, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so we um, so I'll show you what what, what we did. So in, um, the the scapula, the left scapula was uh, was straightforward parallel pair. We shielded a bit of lung down here. Um, 
lesion and that that would be very difficult to to treat that in the future so we just played around and said uh, and and put a field on to cover the whole of the lung um just to see how big that was and then that actually came just above the um the the t7 so um that would be difficult to to encompass later so in the end we we made a a uh, large field covering um, covering the right lung lung lesion with some shielding, um, and then the both the C six and the the T seven. So um, we fractionated that to twenty and five, but the the scapula we um, we treated as a single fraction. Um, we also tried to do a separate uh, separate field with just the scapula and the the neck, but that that ended up to too big as well so that's why we we did two fields in the end uh, with a parallel opposed pair to both so um third case there are there is a, questions from the audience oh yes uh, i think we'll move on okay, to the next case uh, we are a bit short on time we'll we will take yeah. the question There's a question on the Q&A. Okay, so we have, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, right. So I think uh, it goes in line with what was discussed. Uh, some would treat only uh, symptomatic site and uh, others would treat both the, the cord and the yeah, I think initially we aimed to just treat the two symptomatic areas, but because yeah, it was yeah, yeah. overlapping the yeah, lung. Yeah. yeah, okay. okay. So uh, third case, 85-year-old gentleman, history of lung fibrosis. So he didn't have good lung function at baseline. Um, he also had atrial fibrillation, had a pacemaker for that. Uh, presented to A&E with left uh, arm and scapular pain. Um, P performance status two to three. Um, in a and &E, they did an urgent uh, CT angiogram because they worried about uh, an aneurysm. Um, and, and they actually found uh, this, which is a subpleural lesion invading into the um, vertebral body uh, that was tracking up into, um, quite into the apex of the, the lung. So he had a PET CT, which you can show it's lit up there. No disease elsewhere. Uh, EBUS was negative, uh, but at the lung MDT, um, they thought it would be difficult to biopsy, and they were confident that this was a lung cancer. Um, so he was referred initially for radical radiotherapy. So it was deemed in the MDT and uh, not not surgically resectable because of the invasion into the bone. But instead, he was referred for radical radiotherapy. And I guess my first question to um, to the audience would be, um, what factors in the history will make it difficult? Um, to offer radical radiotherapy to this patient? And if so, what, what would you offer instead? And then if, what are your main concerns in your, with your radiotherapy planning? Okay, so while the audience uh, begins to comment, uh, can I ask Professor Hoskin, do you think this is uh, um, radically treatable or? Well, I guess the main issue is the pacemaker. Um, and so I, I would need a, a full cardiological assessment to know how dependent he was on the pacemaker. Uh, it says he had it for atrial fibrillation, I think, in which case it might be quite feasible to be switching off the pacemaker during radiotherapy, which is something that's quite feasible by placing a magnet around it, um, or simply to be monitoring him during radiotherapy. So I wouldn't want that to exclude him from having um, radical treatment. It's also possible to transpose the pacemaker to another part of the chest um, if that is a particular problem for, um, for, for beam entry. Because I think by other criteria, he is certainly uh, a candidate who could be considered for radical treatment. Um, there are other issues about the, 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 the tumor going into the bone and also proximity to the um, trachea and major blood vessels, which um, certainly a, a, for stereotactic radiotherapy would be um, uh, would be a, something we would need to consider certainly in terms of um, uh, normal tissue tolerances when we were planning. 
but yes, I would still want to consider him for radical treatment if at all possible. But will you consider radical treatment for an 85 year old with ECOG 2 to 3 prop? Yes. <laughs> we, we have no ageism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. His, uh, his lung, lung, I should also point out that his lung function wasn't very good as well from his fibrosis. So that was a big concern. Okay. I think. Uh... What dose, uh, if you're going for radical treatment, what kind of dose fractionation are you thinking of? Well, so uh, the question is what kind, what dose uh, would you deliver if, uh, if you're treating this radically? Well, it would depend if he were, if we could uh, treat stereotactically within the, um, tolerances of the, um, the, the the large vessels on the trachea, then, then we would give three large fractions to be given the equivalent of 60 gray, uh, to the equivalent of 100 gray, um, three times 20, or um, it's actually scaled down if you use um, uh, Monte Carlo uh, dosimetry algorithms. Um, if we couldn't, then he would certainly, in our hands, he'd be a candidate for chart. Um, or else um, a, a conventional fractionated schedule, and you could then consider chemo radiation. Okay, so there is a comment uh, by one of the attendees who says, not fit enough for radical treatment due to medical complications. Uh, yeah, so uh, Robin, uh, can you uh, tell us what, what you, how you treated this patient? Yeah, yeah, so uh, also, I mean, it was, it was also quite close to the brachial plexus as well. Um, which you'll have to consider. So we, um, we initially uh, planned this with, with palliative radiotherapy, with uh, aiming for 30 and 10, with a, initially with a parallel opposed pair, um, but then our, our physics department got involved and the, the dose to the, the pacemaker would be 2.5 gray, which would exceed the tolerance. His, um, when I spoke to him actually uh, to get more of a history about the pacemaker, he'd, he had it just for, for um, control of his atrial fibrillation, never had heart block, uh, certainly wasn't pacemaker dependent. Um, but in the end, we um, we just used an oblique pair. Um, there was still concern that the, the pacemaker would still get an um, a excessive dose. Um, but as he wasn't pacemaker dependent, we, instead of dropping the dose to, to 20 and 5, um, we, because this would be his only treatment, we, we kept it at 30 and 10 uh, and just uh, aimed for the pacemaker to be switched off. As suggested. Right, yeah. next case. Um, apologies, there's lots of images for this. Uh, and it's, um, so, this is a 60 year old lady um, who I actually saw in clinic last week. Um, so, she had a previous uh, lobectomy, uh, 2000, oh, sorry, 2017, uh, for non small cell lung cancer, uh, had recurrence in July, and had chemotherapy. Initially had a good response, but then February uh, 2019 had progression uh, with chest wall, um, chest wall recurrence and had a course of 50 and 20 of radiotherapy to the, to the lesion here. Um, that was planned um, conformally well, with IMRT. Um, then April, so that's four or five months afterwards, had a, a progression close by, but not, not in direct overlap. Um, so I had some palliative radiotherapy to that, 30 and 10. That was once again planned conformally just because of the concern about that, that there might still be some overlap. Um, then in between that had some systemic treatment. Um, but now last week was referred to us um, with a painful lump in her axilla, which is where the, the previous lesion was. Uh, necrotic, um, frequent infections to this area and occasional bleeding. So she's referred to us for, uh, for further radiotherapy. Uh, and just to show you the three, uh, well, the two previous fields, and certainly you can see that, that this appears to be in the, the same area of where, um, with the chemo and the systemic treatment, they did respond for a short time, but certainly progressed in that, that area. So that's the site of, the, of, of concern really now. Um, the, the depth was, was um, over six centimeters. Um, so I guess the, the first question is, what, what dose for re radiation would you give? Uh, and how would you treat this? What beam arrangements? And also a consideration of what toxicities this may cause her. Okay, so uh, we are a bit behind time, uh, but 
very quickly, can I ask Professor Chowdhury, what do you think about the uh, re-radiation in this context? He's already had radiotherapy twice. Uh, and what are the implications of that? Um, so I think re-radiation is always one of the more challenging areas that we deal with because I don't, because it isn't a rule book um, as far as I'm aware. So it's down to experience, it's down to trying to balance the potential toxicities um, against the benefit. And um, every patient is particularly unique um, in this setting. So it's very hard even to go from either your experience or other people's. Um, so I think in this situation, um, it feels like there probably aren't a lot of options. Looking at that, you know, it's surgery or, you know, she's already had systemic treatment. What else can we give her? It's going to be horrible. It's necrotic. It's painful. It's bleeding. It's unsightly. So I would consider re radiation. She's clearly had a reasonable dose, 50 grain, 20 fractions to that area um, within the last two years. Um, there's no overlap to the second area that she's treat that's been treated, I don't think. Um, so I sometimes use something like, I guess, what some people call the tumor static dose. So something like six gray weekly um, to try and get some local control and symptom relief. And if the toxicity becomes um, an issue, then you can stop it quite easily. Um, I would probably plan this um, so 3D conformal rather than a skin markup or doing something on a V-SIM um, just so that I've got a better idea of the overlapping doses and volume that's been previously treated. Okay, so we have a comment from a delegate who says eight gray single dose. Uh, um, yeah, Professor Hoskin will be pleased with that the terminology is single dose and not single fraction. So, uh, Robin, uh, could you tell us how uh, how this patient was treated? Yeah, so so we we discussed it at our um, our lung uh, radio radiation meeting, um, and they they decided on close to uh, to eight gray. We we actually gave six gray, um, and when it came to um, to planning it, um, certainly if if it wasn't uh, as deep, we we probably would have used electrons. Um, but seven or well, six and a half centimeters is just a bit too deep. So we, um, in the end, we actually just planned it as an oblique um, field with the isocenter just at the, the depth there, um, accepting that there will be, be overlap. Um, and one, one other thing, so we, we also had to twist the collimator because the field was coming through her, through her shoulder there. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, we have, uh reach the end of this uh, session, uh, Robin. So thank you very much. It was yep. uh, four very interesting cases and uh, it ends uh, with a single dose being delivered and it's time to now uh, move on to Prof Huskin's talk on single dose radiotherapy uh, for palliation. Thank you. Uh, again, we would encourage our audience to, we've had a few comments, to interact uh, with the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking me to talk on single-dose radiotherapy for palliation. It's important to realise the goals of palliative oncology. Primarily, they are symptom control and improvements in quality of life. There may be improvements in survival, but these are not the main goal of treatment. Another important concept is this of opportunity cost when palliating uh, conditions such as bone metastasis. It applies in fact to all treatments. And in this, um, we have two components. One is the currency, which the patient has to spend. And the currency is time. They have a limited amount of time to live, average life expectancy of a patient with bone metastasis is of the order of six months. Brain metastasis may be shorter. And part of the cost of that will be toxicity. So how much time do we think they should invest? 
we look at this simple table, if a patient has a prognosis of three months and we give them a single fraction, we have used 0.1% of their remaining life time. If we give them 20 fractions, we've used 29% of their remaining lifetime. Obviously, as the prognosis is elongated, uh, so the proportion drops. But you can see there that um, we can take up a significant amount of a patient's remaining lifespan by daily visits to a radiotherapy facility to deliver radiotherapy. And we have to be very sure that we are giving them good treatment, effective treatment, but also uh, the and optimal palliation will be the shortest, simplest, least toxic treatment, which is consistent with efficacy. By definition, this is a single dose, provided it works. So why do we think a single dose of radiation would be sufficient when we may give 15, 20, 30 or more fractions to cure a cancer? Well, if we just look at the rate of biology, this is a very old paper from the Royal Marsden Hospital in 1984. And this looked at a concept known as SF2, the surviving fraction of cells after exposure to just two gray in human tumor cell lines. And I've selected some of the more common cancers there in their paper, breast, bladder, cervix, pancreas, colon, rectum, lung. And if you just scan the figures on the right, you'll see that they are of the order of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, uh, if we look at the uh, means which are given for those two groups of tumours, we see it's about 0 0.46 or 0 0.43. In other words, somewhere between um, 40 and 50 percent of cells um, survive. And this means over half of cells in a population, uh, in uh, culture at least, are killed by the first two gray. Of course, to cure a patient, the challenge is to eradicate the remainder. But to eradicate half the patient's cells may be all we need to do uh, to provide good palliation. So let's look at some examples of single dose palliation and the evidence for them. We can look at bone pain, metastatic spinal canal compression, brain metastasis, non-small cell lung cancer, common examples where we will be uh, delivering palliative treatment. Well, the story about metastatic bone pain has been well rehearsed. Here you see uh, a series of uh, bone pain trials which were undertaken across a, a decade or more, um, some 20 years ago. Uh, I was involved in the two trials on the left hand side of this slide. There was the Dutch trial on the right, which is the largest bone pain trial which has been undertaken over 1100 patients. A similar trial on the bottom right uh, from Denmark. And they all show the same thing, uh, that if you compare a single dose with multiple doses in a randomized controlled trial with objective measures of pain and definitions of pain response, there is no difference in the outcome whether it's by the number of patients re uh, achieving response, the time to response, the number of patients achieving complete response, and so on. There are now meta-analyses out there. This is probably the most recent that I was involved in. And you see there, there are a large number of trials which have asked the same question. Is a single dose as good as multiple doses? And in all those trials, if you look at the forest plot on the right, you see uh, an amazing picture of all those points of equipoise uh, being right down the middle uh, with no evidence uh, from any of those trials that more than a single dose uh, is better for pain control. What we do know, however, is that there is a difference and that is with single doses, um, it is more likely that retreatment will be given. And here you see the same series of studies who reported retreatment at least uh, and there you see um, a higher probability of needing retreatment uh, if a single dose is given. So what we can say is that single doses of radiotherapy for metastatic bone pain are equivalent to multiple fractions.
for complete response, for overall response, for duration of response. But we can also say that single dose treatment is more likely to be followed by retreatment. And that probability is around about 20, 25% of patients will go to retreatment. Of course, the question is why single dose treatment is more likely to be followed by retreatment. It may not entirely be because of impaired efficacy. It may partly be because of lack of confidence in single doses, both from the physician and the patient. It may also be that it is much uh, easier and more comfortable to give an extra dose when you've given only one dose. But there may also be uh, some cases where the single dose is less effective uh, in terms of duration of response. Does retreatment matter? And this is a subject which we've looked at over the years. You see the very first paper I published on retreatment for metastatic bone pain back in 1994 when I was at the Royal London Hospital. And what we showed there um, was that uh, if you took patients who were retreated, and you see here the table on the left, um, these were patients who were retreated once, patients were retreated twice, and if they retreated, were retreated with a single dose, um, you see here very high response rates, 78%, uh, 100%, and uh, single doses of Tengre here. And if you look at their first retreatment re response, uh, the majority uh, achieved response. Um, very similar response rates as you would get to initial treatment um, with something like uh, three quarters achieving um, a overall response and a third uh, achieving a complete re response. So retreatment is effective. The question is how much more effective and do we need to retreat? shows that uh, we randomized 850 patients and ultimately, um, as was always the case with these metastatic uh, palliative patients, um, a number were um, lost on the way. There were 425 in a single fraction group receiving 8 gray, 425 receiving 20 gray in 5 fractions, all having retreatment after previous treatment for metastatic bone pain at the same site. And ultimately, we had 258 analysed for the single dose, 263 for multiple doses. What were the well, the results showed that in fact um, both treatments were efficacious. Uh, you see here uh, the relevant box showing overall response was um, depending upon whether you looked at intention to treat or the actual treatment received, round about 30% by intention to treat around 45 to 50 percent by the actual treatment received with complete responses perhaps a little lower than you would expect for primary treatment but nonetheless a significant number of patients achieving complete response equally important there was no advantage for multiple fractions in retreatment compared with a single dose of eight gray an initial single fraction therapy and those that had received a multiple fraction therapy and once again, if we look across uh, at the actual response rates, um, we see there's no difference whether they received a single dose initially or whether they received multiple doses initially, still round about a 50% response rate in all those groups. We come back to the original question, uh, what is the best treatment? What is the most efficient treatment for these patients? We consider the median survival of patients with bone metastasis is six months. Then a single dose, which I think I've shown you is as effective as anything else, will take up simply 0.055% of their survival time. If we give 10 fractions, we're taking up 8%. If we give 20 fractions, we're taking up 15.5%. One sixth of their survival will be taken up delivering uh, radiotherapy. And even if we throw in the argument that a single dose can be uh, followed by retreatment, we still uh, will only be using um, less than 1% of their survival. Well, let's look at other examples. We've considered bone pain. What about metastatic spinal canal compression? An emergency, an important palliative treatment uh, with dire consequences for the patient if it's not adequately controlled. There are a number of studies out there uh, looking at retrospective series. This is one of the larger ones. Uh, group led by Dirk Rads in Hamburg, uh, five different radiation schedules 
um, looking at the response rates for metastatic spinal canal compression. You see there a single dose of 8 gray, 20 gray in 5 fractions, 30 gray in 10 fractions, 37.5 gray in 15 fractions, or 40 gray in 20 fractions. And if we look as outcome measures, motor function improvement, and ambulatory status following radiotherapy, there was no difference by dose fractionation. Following on this, we undertook a large randomized controlled trial in the United Kingdom to compare multifraction radiotherapy against single fraction radiotherapy. In metastatic spinal canal compression, we looked at ambulatory status, bowel and bladder function, quality of life, the need for further treatment, Toxicity, of course, and survival. This was the scale. This was the design. Uh, as you see there, we started with 687 patients, randomized two ways. 342 received 20 grain, five fractions. 345 received a single dose of eight grain. And you see there the various assessments, uh, one week, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, following randomization with a baseline against which they were compared. The ambulatory status was the primary outcome measure, and this was defined by a four-point scale. You see there, uh, grades one and two were ambulatory, with or without assistance. Grade three was some power left, but unable to ambulate, and grade four was complete paraplegia. The patient characteristics, uh, the majority were mobile. You see there, something like two-thirds of patients uh, were walking, um, some with AIDS, some without, which was grade one or grade two. Uh, we look at performance status. Um, well, about a third of patients were WHO performance status three. In other words, they were, they were relatively uh, immobile. Uh, even though they could walk, uh, they were not spending time um, outside uh, or, or other than uh, undertaking simple uh, daily tasks of living. We look at the number of spinal canal compression sites. The majority had a single site, but about 10% had multiple sites. And 44% of patients in each arm had prostate cancer. You see there uh, the mix of other cancers. It's fair to say, I think, that uh, perhaps breast cancer in particular is underrepresented in this trial. Here's the survival data, um, and there was no difference in survival whether patients got a single dose or multiple doses. You see there the median survival time of these patients with metastatic spinal canal compression is of the order of 13 weeks. And if we look at change in ambulatory status um, across the time frames from 0 to 2 weeks out to 10 to 14 weeks, um, we see there that on the forest plot uh, and looking at the um, hazard ratios and p-values, there is no difference between the eight gray arm and 20 gray and five fraction. This data has been incorporated in a meta-analysis. And here you see uh, the results of the meta-analysis published in the Green Journal last year. And once again, these demonstrate there is no advantage for multiple fractions over single fractions um, for the treatment of metastatic spinal cord compression, looking at both motor function there and bladder function. So once again, we see um, high level evidence, randomized controlled trials showing no advantage for multiple fractions. Let's look at one or two other examples. Many years ago, there were a series of randomized uh, fractionation studies in the United States looking at various dose fractionation schedules from which the standard of 30 gray and 10 fractions or 20 gray and five fractions has emerged. But often forgotten, there were two other uh, trials, 12 gray and two fractions or 10 gray as a single dose. In fact, when you would look at the data, all those schedules appeared equivalent. And the median survivals in these patients were poor, but what we would expect in patients with multiple brain metastases, particularly in an era before effective systemic treatment, of 15 to 21 weeks. Here are the two studies that looked at um, 10 gray as a single dose and 12 gray in two fractions, the so-called ultra rapid um, fractionations. A small number, 59 patients, um, but you see there no difference in survival. And in fact, the survival is not so very different to those in the higher fractionation schedules 
who were selected patients for better prognosis. It's important also to remember that in some patients with poor pro performance status, um, radiotherapy probably sh isn't, has no role and should not be considered. This is the results of the Quartz study, uh, which showed on the left there that um, whether patients were randomized to best supportive care or best supportive care and whole brain radiotherapy, there was no difference in survival. And on the right, these are the quality of life measures. And similarly, we can see that whole brain radiotherapy did not improve quality of life over best supportive care in these selected patients with poor performance status and non-small cell lung cancer. So we must very carefully select any radiotherapy for patients with brain metastasis. At the other end of the scale, of course, there are patients uh, with oligometastases, um, one, two, three, four metastases localized uh, in the brain. And these patients may well benefit from a more radical approach. In some, it will be surgery. In others, surgery may not be feasible. You see here two large randomized trials, one from the Japanese Radiation Oncology Study Group, the other from Andy Anderson. And these showed that there was no compelling difference, certainly in survival, between stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic radiosurgery given as an adjunct to whole brain radiotherapy. What we now know is that with stereotactic radiosurgery alone, there is far less neurocognitive impact from treatment compared with whole brain radiotherapy. And it has therefore become very much uh, the preferred. And single doses with SRS can be given, doses between 18 and 24 gray. Here you see that the effect in terms of local control does seem to be uh, size related. And as you would expect, um, as we go up to higher sizes, um, maybe we need um, um, higher doses. Let's look at another example of lung cancer. And um, in the UK, again, there were a series of randomized trials. Uh, here you see back in the 1990s again, and um, one that looked at a single dose, uh, compared 10 gray single dose against 17 gray and two fractions. And you see here in the top right hand corner, uh, the various um, uh, symptoms that were measured. And if you scan those rows, there is no difference between the F1, which is the single dose, and the F2, which is the two fraction schedule. And if we look at performance status and dysphagia, on the left, no difference in performance status. On the right, in fact, in increased dysphagia in the two fraction schedule compared with the one fraction schedule. And overall, no difference in survival. So again, these are selected non-small cell lung cancer patients with poor performance status. We know that those with good performance status may well benefit from a higher dose. But in this group of patients who are receiving palliative radiotherapy, um, a single dose of Tengre uh, appears as effective as a more prolonged treatment course. And it had been previously shown that 17 gray and two fractions was as good in this group of patients as a schedule of 30 gray and 10 fractions. There are other ways of giving radiotherapy in lung cancer. Endobronchial brachytherapy uh, is not widely used, but is an effective palliative treatment. Here you see a large series from the Christie Hospital in Manchester, 406 patients. A single dose of 15 gray, 18% in fact got a single dose of 20 gray. And you see there for symptoms, particularly those associated with endobronchial um, effects, around about 90% were controlled, 50 to 60% had responses uh, for cough, dyspnea, pain, and lung collapse. And there are many more examples. Um, here you see the results of uh, intraluminal brachytherapy um, for cancer of the esophagus, again from the Christie, and 54% uh, relief of dysphagia, 91% able to tolerate a soft or diet. Uh, more recently, a randomized trial from the Netherlands comparing the use of a stent with a single dose of 12 gray brachytherapy. And what you see here is that the initial uh, response, uh, which is shown on the left here, um, is similar, but um, the dysphagia scores in the uh, stent group start to rise after the first three months, presumably due to tumor regrowth, whereas they remain low and um, are durable uh, in the 12 gray brachytherapy group. And therefore a significant advantage for patients with a survival time of more than three months uh, for brachytherapy over the use of a stent. 
Similarly, at Mount Vernon, we have considerable experience of using um, rectal brachytherapy, delivering a single dose of ten gray. And here again, you see um, response rates um, for bleeding, uh, complete response, 56%, 31% complete response of pain, um, diarrhea, um, 55%. Not so effective for mucus discharge. But again, a simple single dose treatment for patients with um, very troublesome symptoms. So I have, I hope, uh, given you uh, good reason to consider single dose radiotherapy for palliation. Um, we've looked at bone pain, metastatic spinal canal compression, brain, brain metastasis, non-small cell lung cancer, and others. And there is good evidence, in many of them high-level evidence, randomized controlled trials, showing that single doses are as good as multiple doses. And as I hope I showed you at the beginning, for the patient, this makes a substantial impact on their quality of life and the amount of time you will take up uh, with that patient needing to go to hospital, uh, which is unnecessary in the final months of their life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Hoskin, uh, for your talk on single dose uh, palliative radiotherapy. Um, and as you saw, Professor Hoskin himself was involved in a number of trials on single dose palliative radiotherapy. Uh, there is there, there are a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one is, if there is a soft tissue mass associated with cord compression, would a single dose be effective? And how soon can re-radiation of the cord be done after a single dose at the same site? Um, well, two very difficult questions. <laughs> um, so for soft tissue mass, we didn't really look at that in the SCOMED trial. And I think as, as the previous case, demonstrated uh, you need to decide what you're trying to achieve for the patient if you actually want to achieve tumor eradication then clearly you need a larger dose than eight gray if you're looking for pain relief and um, recovery of neurological function then eight gray is sufficient so it really depends whether you have a patient with metastatic disease poor performance status or whether this is a localized presentation uh, for which you're looking at a more permanent solution. Retreatment is difficult. Um, the conventional wisdom is that you should leave six months between um, cord, certainly treatment for cord compression, and then retreatment for painful uh, bone metastasis. Uh, and there are um, clear uh, dose tolerances that we can look at. Uh, but in general, um, it's certainly possible to retreat after a single dose of eight gray with a further eight gray. And we would usually say within six months um, is perfectly adequate and safe. Okay. Thank you, Professor Askin. Uh, so we now move on to the next segment of uh, case discussions. And uh, my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Naduni Imbulgoda to lead the discussion. Thank you, Nurat. Um, so, uh, my case, I'd like to thank Dr. Shandima Vitanage at the Jasna for helping me with these cases. Um, so, the first case is um, a 41 year old lady, right handed lady, mother of two children. She presented to us with a feeling of severe pain in her right arm, preventing sleep, and on examination, she had a really large right breast mass, and there was uh, axillary lymph node, and there was a um, right upper limb, there was an uh, C8, C1 root lesion in the right upper limb. So this was what her breast mass looked like. And she had a, um, and so we gave her some uh, painkillers, some analgesics, and we did a biopsy from the breast, and that showed it was an ER, ER positive, and her two negative uh, carcinoma of the breast. The CT test had the cell, which showed there was a, Small volume multiple liver metastasis, and there were a lot of axillary nodes, but there were no lung metastasis, and um, there was a skin deposit of the scapula, which was not painful. And you also did because of the pain in the upper limb, we did the MRI of the uh, axilla and the uh, lower neck, and I will just like to show you what that looked like. So I would like to ask um, what the structures are. So with this. Uh, just go to them quickly. So this is the pec major and the pec minor, and this would be a, a level three lymph node. So her main concern was a pain in her arm, 
and heaviness and bleeding in her chest. She, she did not want to have chemotherapy because she wanted to avoid frequent hospital visits and she wanted to prefer more time with her two young children. So um, how would you manage her? Uh, so she went ahead to have radiation. So what would be your dose fractionation and what would be your field? So I've just outlined um, what the proxima was uh, in the breast and the node deposit here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we can ask the ask the audience uh, uh, what you know, what dose would you uh, use and what what would be your uh, radiotherapy technique. Um, can I ask uh, Dr. Robin Fortner for while the audience responds, uh, what he thinks about this case and how how would he he would treat. Sorry, uh, firstly, remind me of the, the biopsy. So was it ER positive? Yeah, positive, HER2 negative. Yeah, so, so you could probably start them on some endocrine therapy anyway. Um, but then how would I treat this? Uh, I would still treat it with a parallel, so with a tangent pair covering the breast and, uh, um, and a matched on anterior field. With um, with twenty and five. Okay, uh, Nadini. Uh... Yeah. So, um, well, for us, uh, her main problem was the pain in the arm, which prevented her from treating. So we really wanted to get this um, the node, uh, the node, uh, the pain left in the node. So uh, we decided to go for a sort of a higher fractionation than that. So we thought that to eradicate a breast tumor, we need about 60 gray. So the patient was treated with a dose of 36 and six weekly fractionation. So we give it one week and we can assess again and see how she responds and go ahead. But the issue was uh, the level was there was a level three lymph node with compressing the brachial plexus. And brachial plexus tolerance was an issue um, what I thought of. So uh, if you do need to give 60 gray, uh, that would be very close to brachial plexus tolerance. And there were some studies um, that showed that if the, the, the dose of brachial plexus was above a close 60 gray, very quite um, old studies that showed that there could be maybe about 73% of risk of brachial plexus injury. But uh, the current adjuvant doses that we use, that's not the case. So uh, I thought I would limit my supraclavicular dose to uh, 24 grain four fractions in the six week vaccination schedule. But I also had to make sure that the GTV wasn't missed because the GTV was in the level three area, which can be quite, uh, which is sort of where actually the field matching occurs. So just a bit about the doses we use. So 36 and 6 is if you do to equal to 64 grain, but if you use something like um, 17 5, I thought that would be not enough of a dose for her, sort of like 28 grain. And just a quick word on the adjuvant doses, 14, 15, and 26 and 5, that cause that gives a lot of dose of like around 40 grain if you do to. So that's why we it's a higher dose between here. And so this is uh, where the tumor was. So we put a field here, and this was the uh, the node was. Um, so this was the DRR. So just a little word on the node level. So this is level one, and level two is just behind the pet minor, and level three is just above here, and this is level four. And so this really had a lesion in level three. Uh, and this was the dose distribution we have for a tangent, and the supraclavicular for our field when you put it direct. We can actually get quite a good dose distribution to the level three level, as you can see here. And if you sort of extend to the axilla, you can get a level one uh, coverage as well. And if you do it parallel opposed, you can get a really good coverage in the level one, two, and three, everything. And this was a high tangent field where uh, the breast, okay. we went, the, we put the tangents a bit higher up than um, it usually was. It. So that covered uh, the level one, two, and the level one, two as well. So yeah, uh, uh, there is a question. Uh, okay, sorry. No. There's a question from the audience: uh, yeah. Why radical doses in metastatic setting? And uh, someone has suggested uh, eight gray single dose as well. So this is a patient um, with uh, lung. Think, yeah. Okay. 
Well, from a talk just now, we understood that uh, the spinal cord can tolerate, can be released by uh, eight gray single. But um, we felt that uh, we need to control the tumor as well. So a single dose of eight gray would have difficulty in controlling her tumor. So that's why we made for 36 weekly. So she had one fraction six gray, and then she goes home. So the next fraction is next week. She wishes she can come. If she feels everything sorted out, she can perfectly not come as well. So that's why we had this weekly fractionation, then having like one week fractionation. Um, uh, Dr. Rajasurya, um, Prashanti, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, oh. Right, okay. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, Nadini, I think you can proceed. Uh, you're having difficulty connecting. All right, so this is just um, a quick Sorry, I just asked a question from Nadini. Can I, Nadini, did you treat the supraclavicular prosop prophylactically to 24 gray? And uh, no, uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, no, but did this patient have a supraclavicular node as well, or just level three node only? It's a level three you node. Know. Yeah, so. I wouldn't have gone to that high dose since she is uh, uh, ER PR positive because uh, then hormones also will give her some response. So maybe a shorter fractionation, 20 in five. Okay. Um, Dr. Nadini, is there any role for surgery in this sort of patient to get local control? Oh, well, I would um, ask an option. But I think a radiation would be a good control for her uh, because she um, uh, because uh, she has liver mess as well. So uh, surgery would be um, I would think a bit difficult. But and I think radiation would get a really good palliation versus surgery in this setting. And but how, how did you process in the post? Sorry? How did you treat the skin deposit? Oh, uh, the skin deposit, uh, that uh, skin deposit was serially. Uh, uh, I packed that with electrons. Um, uh, that was uh, back to my doctor. Yeah. Did she have symptoms? Or you just it wasn't symptomatic. We didn't treat that at that time. Okay, I think we can move on uh, to the next case. Uh, okay. So uh, we oh, treated okay. her with uh, high tangents actually. The high tangents was able to cover the level three node. We didn't need to go for the supraclavicular fossa. As Prashanti said, we could, have, we could be able to cover the field with high tangents. We could, have, we could avoid the supraclavicular fossa, so this is much easier setup uh, for a palliative patient like her. So we'll move on to the next case. Um, so this is a 22-year-old man presenting with uh, generalized seizures and had an MRI done. His performance status uh, improved the two after he had some steroids. So this is what his MRI looked like. And um, he had um, discussed that MDT was not a candidate for surgery. He had a biopsy. It was a DBM, glioblastoma, MGMT methylated. So how would you manage this situation? Of the okay, so can we have some uh, responses uh, from the audience? And uh, while the audience responds, can I ask Professor Hoskin uh, um, his thoughts on this case? Uh, Thanks, Nirad. Um, I didn't catch his uh, his neurological function and performance status uh, at this point. Uh, so he was performance status two. So it's, okay. Uh, his neurological was okay, but his PS2 after the steroids, after some yeah. medication. So he's borderline really for radical treatment. Um, but I think probably in a 22 year old man, if he were, so performance status two is on the basis of hemiplegia, presumably. Yes. Um, which is likely to be irreversible if it's not responded to steroids. Um, 
I, mean, I think we, we would give him um, 40 grain, 15 fractions to a, a planned volume. Um, and probably um, he is MGMT positive, so we probably would still give that with Timozolomide, even though um, he obviously has limited performance status and therefore his outcome is likely to be quite poor. So I think 40 grain, 15 fractions with daily Timozolomide would be our um, approach to that. There's evidence 40 grain, 15 is, is as effective as 60 and 30, although the, I accept the level one evidence of Timozolomide is with 60 and 30. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Prof, will you offer adjuvant temesolamide as well, or just top after chemo radiation? Yes, no, we would we would follow um, the, 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 the the protocol. So it would depend, of course, on his tolerance of the radiation. So I mean, in general, this patient is going to do one of two things: he'll either actually improve during radiation, and his performance status will will move up to to one. Um, or else he's going to deteriorate quite quickly. And I think one would be quite concerned. He's got a very large tumour, um, and it's very likely that that's going to deteriorate during treatment, and actually his performance status will worsen. And in that case, we would then um, not go on with adjuvant treatment, but um, treat him with best supportive care. Okay. If the patient responds well, how many cycles of adjuvant uh, temesolamide will you give? Is it just for 12 months or will you continue indefinitely? No, we will give him for 12 months, yes. Thanks, Prof. Right. So, yeah, there's a comment from the audience which uh, basically agrees with what Prof has said, 40 grain, 15 fraction, yeah, with temesolamide, yeah. Uh, so now the knee, you can uh, proceed on this. So this is um, an next case. This is also a younger lady. Uh, house five persons in fragile onset weakness in right upper limb and lower limb. And to a local hospital medical clinic, she had uh, some delay in getting her MRI done. And uh, now she's on uh, like six weeks delay. And now she's um, unable to walk and needs assistance and needs a wheelchair to go to the toilet because of this neurological deficit. And this was her MRI scan, which is, um, and uh, so she um, was like performance status uh, three basically by now because there was a bit of a delay in presentation. So would it be the same or would you treat differently? So I don't know if that was directed to me or not, but <laughs> I think um, her performance status now is, I mean, she's a different patient, but the performance status is poor, um, and you've got a tumour that's occupying roughly two-thirds of the brain. Um, I think we would probably elect not to treat this patient. Okay. Yes, there is a comment from the audience saying supportive care only, and uh, another comment saying, would you insist on a VP shunt before the start of radiotherapy, assuming uh, you would treat this patient with radiotherapy? Well, this patient, I, it, I, I don't see hydrocephalus okay. there. Did I miss something on, the, uh, on other scans? No, no, I, I didn't. No. Okay. I mean, in the absence of hydrocephalus, I certainly wouldn't know. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. Something uh, in the previous case, uh, this tumor is causing um, the corpus callosum here. So, would this sort of fall into what we call a butterfly cladoma and would you consider a short fraction of that, like 30, 60, two weeks? What could you think about that sort of fractionation, considering that it's causing the corpus callosum? Yes, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I agree it's. It's, yes, it's not quite a butterfly, but almost. <laughs> and, um, uh, and as you're implying, it has a poor prognosis. Um, I think we certainly use the weekly fractionation uh, for patients with poorer prognosis. Uh, it would not be inappropriate. Um, we would give 30 gray and six fractions. Um, I think in this patient, his performance status is two, he's 22. Um, I might give him the benefit of the doubt and go for a slightly more radical approach with the 40 grain 15 fractions. But um, it's a fair point. Uh, certainly that would not be inappropriate. Okay. 
and cross, um, how important is crossing the corpus callosum in a GBM? Is it like, is it really important in deciding a dose fraction is no? Would performance status be more important to you? Well, performance status every time. Hmm. Thanks. Then with the next case, uh, so. Can I go to the next case? Yeah, yeah. Oh, are there questions? Uh, uh, just uh, two questions while we're on the subject of another uh, one. Second. So uh, there are some audience questions in relation to uh, uh, while we're on the subject of brain palliative radiotherapy. Uh, can an eight gray uh, single dose be delivered for whole brain radiotherapy? Um, Prof, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it can be. Um, I, it's just not an area where there's any evidence for eight gray. Um, if you look at the RTOG studies, they gave 10 gray, um, and you might argue, well, what's the difference? I, I don't think it matters, but the evidence base would be for 10 gray. Um, that's just a feature of what was tested in the clinical trial, and I don't think it would be inappropriate to give 8 gray, and I doubt there's any difference between giving 8 gray and giving 10 gray. Okay, thanks, bro. Yeah, no, then. The next case is a um, 50 year old lady with the diabetes, and uh, she had the stage 3B carcinoma of cervix. And she completed TMRT 45 gray in um, some fraction, sorry. Um, and she also had the inter and she had the stage 3B cancer, but she had um, uh, uh, three gray fractions, three fractions of brachytherapy, but she, she did not have interstitial boost. And that was given about six years ago. And then she before follow up, and now she presented to us with uh, heavy bleeding from vagina, severe um, lower back pain and lethargy. Hemoglobin was low at five, and examination and the anesthesia she revealed a fixed tumor mass in the cervix. Um, so, how would you manage her? Okay. Um, right. Nadini, have you got any uh, imaging? COVID images, and yeah. so she had um, a blood transfusion done, and she had some. Oh, yeah. and, and do we know how big the mass is? Uh, no, no, I can't. Sorry. Uh, do we know how big the cervical tumor is? Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we have. So this is the CT, the CT showed bilateral hydronephrosis, uh, but there was no metastasis elsewhere. She had a high creatinine of four due to hydronephrosis. She was seen by nephrology team and stent. And then this was um, what she had in uh, MRI. Okay, uh, right. Um, quite a large tumor. Um, so, can, and then, uh, um, so, uh, uh, management options do you have and uh, what should you do in this situation? Yeah, so can I ask both uh, the Manchester professors who uh, treat pelvic, uh, pelvic radiotherapy? So, is this uh, so six years after radical chemo radiotherapy? Uh, so, how would you, would you, firstly, would you consider this salvageable and or not? And then, what would be your sort of uh, Management. So I have to admit, um, I would um, ask my esteemed colleague, Professor Hoskin, for his opinion in this <laughs> case. I, I think he can, I think she should certainly have um, some retreatment, um, but I would ask whether it's best done using brachytherapy. Well, I, I was struck by the, the fact there's perhaps bladder invasion, um, so I, I would ask, be asking for or a cystoscopy, even if they don't want to put stents in. Um, and also uh, uh, an opinion from a, an exenterative surgeon. Um, I mean, it does look as though it's going out into the parametria and it might be fixed and, and not operable. Um, but obviously an anterior exenteration is, is one option for this lady as a curative procedure. Um, the alternative is Professor Chowdhury um, proposes is to um, offer re-radiation and certainly um, I would say this is implantable um, it would be an interstitial implant and we could certainly cover that we might even be able to 
um, recover the the um, cervical canal and put an intrauterine tube in, but probably it would be an, uh, an interstitial implant. I'd be concerned about the uh, um, posterior bladder wall. I think there's a very serious risk of her having a fistula uh, from that, and, and obviously she would have to be fully aware of that. Um, but I think that would be her best chance. I don't think external beam radiotherapy would be able to deliver a sufficient dose, even using the stereotactic technique, to achieve durable local tumor control. Um, we have, of course, to bear in mind that this has recurred after um, a substantial dose. I mean, she had 45 and 25 and intracavitary, which will have treated this central disease. So uh, it may be only a short-lived response to whatever we do, and that's why I would be keen to get a surgical opinion. Um, but if it was deemed not operable, even with exenterative surgery, or the patient, as is often the case, uh, declined exenterative surgery, then I would certainly be prepared to offer this patient interstitial brachytherapy. Okay. Would you consider um, <laughs> downstaging with some uh, chemo first, with bevacizumab, well, paclitaxel, how flatting in this patient? Yeah. It's, it's a, it, I, I, it's, it sounds rational, um, but if you look at the response rate of um, pelvic disease to chemotherapy after radiotherapy, it's very low. So it's about 20% compared with 60, 70% to actual metastasis elsewhere outside the irradiated field. So my feeling would be the probability of response is, is really very low. And uh, I would be hesitant to delay treating her more definitively. Okay. From the dose you're looking at with the interstitial implant. What's the Sorry, dose? Krishanti, I didn't catch that. Uh, what's the dose you're looking at with interstitial implant? Dose, um, yeah, well, we'd be aiming at a, a radical dose, so we would normally prescribe six gray times six, um, but that would be the minimum peripheral dose. And of course, we would have to um, be attentive, particularly to the anterior rectal dose. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm a little concerned the bladder wall has largely dissolved into the CTV, which is going to cause some problems later on. Um, of course, inside that six gray, you're going to have a very high dose gradient to, to central doses of 12 or 15 gray. But um, clearly, that's what is needed in this situation. But, uh, she had bilateral obstructive uropathy problem. Will you still go to that high dose? So well, I, I would be um, pressing for stents before we did anything, actually. Um, I think um, even though her renal failure, uh, her renal function is not so bad at the moment, um, particularly if we're going to do something which is likely to cause bladder-based edema, uh, then I think it would be a wiser precaution than waiting for her renal function to deteriorate. Okay, uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, Adani uh, can proceed with. Uh, um, she did have that. Yeah, and then uh, because we don't have any of these facilities, we had to uh, as the pump rate was low to chemotherapy, we just had to uh, give a refraction aid just to prevent the bleeding because that was the only option we had for her. Uh, so the next stage, um, uh, just uh, would that be your, I mean, in our setting, would that be the only thing we could do? Give a single no. fraction, single dose? Uh, uh, Prevent the bleeding because so, that was uh, yeah. the issue we had with uh, pain as well. But so if if uh, we don't have oh. uh, Professor Haskin in Sri Lanka to yeah, deliver interstitial brachytherapy, so um, in the absence of uh, brachytherapy as an option, uh, uh, Prof, uh, what do you think? Uh, single dose, or do you think we should go higher than that? Well, I think she hasn't got metastatic disease. Yeah. So she is, she's going to have a, a you know a survival measured in in many months, if not several years, um, if not longer. And I mean, her only danger is blocking her ureters, which will result in renal failure. And and if that happens, clearly that can be a preterminal event if it's not um, diverted. But equally, um, she could have stents or nephrostomies to avoid that. So I'd be inclined to give a more radical dose. I accept its retreatment. Um, and in that situation, we may well look at a stereotactic technique uh, to aim to give a, a, a limited small volume, a very high central dose. 
Okay. So would you suggest like a, a weekly 36 and 6 like better or would you just... Yeah, work? I think that would be, be perfectly reasonable. Um, or um, as I say, if you, if you had a, a, a stereotactic um, a, approach, uh, we would give um, something like three tens. Um, yeah. But um, I think it, the, the decision is, are you going to treat this patient hoping to get durable control? Um, or are you saying the patient is sadly palliative and all we want to do therefore is stop bleeding and allow her to be at home and see what happens? If you, okay. all you want to do is stop bleeding, then yes, single dose of eight gray is all you need to do. Um, if you want to try harder um, and yeah, maybe cause more toxicity for sure. Um, and that's a gamble then as to what you will achieve. Uh, then I think weekly six gray or 40 gray and 15 fractions, if you can um, be away from the anterior rectal wall sufficiently uh, is a perfectly reasonable approach. But you are gonna run into problems for sure. Uh, and as I say, I'd be particularly worried about getting um, a vesicovaginal fistula. Okay, thanks, Prof. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah. Yes, Natalie. So this is um, a 60-year-old male, uh, 3 0 no comorbidities, was diagnosed with C3N1, do not meet rectal adenal carcinoma. Uh, treated with a short course in 25 and 5, followed by anterior resection. It surgery confirmed T3 N1 uh, tumor and uh, CRN negative and 1 in 17 nodes positive. And he had went on to have eight cycles of adjuvant CAPOC. And then six months later, he complains of worsening of back pain. And this is what the MRI shows. There's a lesion here. Uh, uh, just at the end of the sacrum, and uh, this is the CT scan. Mm -hmm. So we've got the sacrum recurrence, and there was no other deposits elsewhere. Uh, so, what would you do? Okay, I think uh, so. Uh, can we have a, a vote uh, from the audience on this? So, uh, if you uh, could you just tell us through the QA app? Uh, whether you go uh, based on the imaging that you have here, whether you treat this uh, radically or would you go down the uh, palliative treatment? Uh, so, yeah, can have some. Okay, we're getting some comments. And I can assure you that uh, every legal vote will be counted. Okay, we are getting some response. Uh, I think our IT team is uh, counting the numbers. Uh, they won't uh, take as long as Pennsylvania, I'm sure, to give us the, the outcome. Okay. Um, can I ask, uh, okay. Okay, so it's 55% uh, to 45%. Uh, so it's an even split. It's, uh, uh, so uh, can I ask Professor Chowdhury, uh, you treat some, uh, you treat pelvic, uh, I mean, pelvic radiotherapy and is this this is is this the uh, salvageable or uh, is this uh, are you going to go with palliation um so i think it's um i think it's challenging and i think as the audience show you can go either way and only time will tell um i think if it is a discrete lesion then it's certainly worth considering um, a certainly a high dose palliation, if um, if nothing else. 
and I think it is worth having a chat to the surgeons. I'm not entirely sure that I've ever seen um, a surgeon um, volunteer to um, operate in this area. So I suspect the patient's going to come the way, come to us. And then the question is, can you give it a stereotactic type dose to at least get good local control, if not cure um, the patient completely? I think oligometastatic disease is, um, is difficult and we're still learning a lot about it. But most patients who have oligometastatic disease present with METs again further in the future. So it's very rarely is curative with intent. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Partner, you're, uh, can we have some uh, uh, a fresh perspective on this? Uh, you do the palliative clinic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I would push for surgery, but I, but I think the, the patient factors is that, that he's he's had a radical dose to the pelvis and he's had adjuvant chemotherapy and progressed within that field within well, within six months um so his prognosis really is 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 bad um and although there's no metastatic disease elsewhere i'm sure it's gonna he's gonna progress quickly after um i would agree with prof chowdhury about about trying to explore um saber to to get a um a radical dose into that area but i think it's it's going to be difficult Prof Hoskin, do you agree with your colleagues in Manchester, or do you think this is uh, <laughs> operable somehow? You're you're provoking me, Nirad, <laughs> but um, I do actually. I am. Um, I, I think this this we, this is a, a patient we see a lot of these referred for CyberKnife, and this is the sort of patient that we we would take on and, and offer a radical uh, ablative dose. Um, yeah. I think. I would certainly consider sacrectomy uh, for this yeah. sort of patient, but I think from, from what I, my interpret, quick interpretation of the scan was that it was actually um, invading the pelvic sidewall to some yeah. extent, and I think that would, would, would probably exclude surgery. Okay. But if it was just um, j just limited to the sacrum, then, then certainly I would, would consider referral for uh, sacrectomy. Otherwise, yeah, a stereotactic um, high-dose treatment, big times 10 gray or thereabouts would be uh, the sort of thing we would offer. Okay, thanks. Prashanti, anything uh, uh, do you agree or would you just give a more palliative dose here, given that it's a recurrence within six months of completion of uh, adjuvant chemo? Prashanti? Sorry. Yeah. So since it's the only side of recurrence, high dose palliation is reasonable. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Nadani, could you? Uh... So this was um, the first plan, and this was what it was. So there's um, you know geographical miss. This was the course twenty five five that we had in the first plan, and so uh, in approval. So this is it. And so we had treatment with um, uh, palliative uh, at 25. Okay, I think uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this uh, session of case discussions. We will now uh, move on to the talk uh, by Professor Chowdhury and Dr. Portner on uh, radical palliation uh, flattening the curve of metastatic progression. Hello, everybody. It, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Robin Portner, who is a senior specialist registrar at the Christie. Robin organizes our palliative radiotherapy clinics that are run by registrars that happen weekly, and therefore he's very well placed to tell us all about high-dose palliative radiotherapy. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Chowdhury, and thank you for the invitation. So I think uh, we need to start off by looking at standard model for radiotherapy, for palliative radiotherapy. So um, this is for patients with locally advanced disease or metastatic disease, or patients who are really not fit for radical treatment. And there's, there needs to be specific goals, really, of their treatment. 
whether that's symptom uh, control, that could be pain or um, bleeding or obstructive symptoms, um, also um, preventing symptoms. So patients with a large mediastinal mass who are at high risk of, uh, of developing a SVCO or a, an airway obstruction, or patients with uh, metastatic um, impending core compression. We also use it for, uh, for local control as well in patients with good prognosis. Commonly, we just use a single eight gray fraction, um, but fractionated regimes of 20 and five and 30 and 10, also uh, very useful, especially if, if you have much larger fields uh, or if there's a large soft tissue component. Uh, radiotherapy is commonly planned with a CT simulator or for superficial treatment or skin treatments, you can use surface uh, markups. Uh, but some centers are still are using uh, 3D conformal or even IMRT for their palliative planning. So I think firstly, we need to ask what is high dose um, palliative radiotherapy? Uh, and actually doing a literature search, I couldn't find one uh, single definition that fits all. Um, I think we need to remember that standard uh, model for radiotherapy um, works well for most patients, uh, especially if you um, if their prognosis isn't particularly good and you're not too worried about long-term toxicity. Um, also, if you um, if you want to get a high dose in quickly, so it still works for most most patients. Um, but which patients would be suitable for higher doses or more complicated regimes? And I'd, I'd say that's patients with um, better prognosis. Um, we are trying to aim for long-term. Um, local control and symptom symptom control. Um, but any changes, any advances in palliative radiotherapy, we, um, compared to previous standard model, need to firstly provide clinical benefit, so better symptom management or uh, longer um, prognosis, prognosis. Um, or they need to have um, improved toxicity profile, and they also need to be practically. Um, uh, acceptable for the for the patient to tolerate. So that leads us into a few studies. So firstly, in head and neck cancer, uh, even with with localized disease, a lot of patients with head and neck cancer actually end up not being suitable for radical treatment, whether that's due to comorbidities or um, performance status. Um, so a lot of patients aren't able to have radical curative treatment. Um, but if untreated. Uh, head and neck cancers can cause very distressing symptoms. So um, bleeding, uh, dysphagia, voice um, problems, swallowing problems. Um, there's really limited data on, on the best regime for, um, for palliative control. Um, but one particular option is using a split course of radiotherapy. So that's using 25, uh, sorry, 20 gray in five fractions over a week and then have two week gap and then have a further 25. Um, and in one retrospective um, study, they looked at three, uh, 33 patients who had this regime uh, and found that um, at four to six weeks after treatment, when acute side effects normally settle down, um, majority of patients, uh, nearly 80%, actually had some symptom um, relief with over half um, with major improvement in their symptoms. And also when, the, when they came to um, do a repeat nasal endoscopy, they actually found that over 70% of patients had good um, response, either complete response or at least partial response to their tumour. Medium overall survival for these patients with just purely this course of radiotherapy was around nine months. Um, An overall toxicity profile was acceptable with grade three toxicities really in a, only in four patients, um, with six patients needing NG feeding. So this was this. This was deemed to be an acceptable um, palliative regime, both symptom and prognostically. We also look at um, patients with um, bladder cancer, with muscle invasive bladder cancer, not suitable for uh, radical treatment. Um, so they compared two, um, two different regimes of um, palliative radiotherapy, um, 35 uh, gray and 10 fractions, which was the most common regime at the time. Uh, and they compared it to 20, 21 and three um, on alternate days over a week, um, which is radiobiologically equivalent, um, but over a much shorter shorter time and um, logistically much much better. 
So they firstly wanted to assess um, overall uh, symptom improvement uh, from any palliative radiotherapy, um, and also compare the two the two different treatment treatments for, for efficacy and also toxicity. So overall, um, approximately 68% uh, of patients had symptomatic improvement, um, and there was no significant difference in the two with the two um, two different treatments. Uh, and there was no difference in um, toxicity with the two arms. So this is another good, um, another alternative. And then we need to look at patients um, with metastatic um, prostate cancer. Um, as part of the STAMPE trial, they looked at patients with newly diagnosed uh, metastatic prostate prostate cancer, so that's a palliative situation, um, but they were looking at the, what the role of um, using radical doses of radiotherapy, so much higher doses than your, your um, standard palliative doses. Um, and they, they um, randomized patients to the standard of care, which at the time was uh, docetaxel and um, hormone treatment, um, to a standard of care with the addition of um, radiotherapy. And they used uh, doses of uh, either 55 gray and 20 fractions over four weeks or 36 gray and six fractions weekly, six weeks at the um, physician's uh, discretion. And their um, primary outcomes was looking at overall survival and um, failure-free um, survival. They also did a subgroup analysis uh, looking at low um, and high burden disease as well, where high burden disease was uh, was patients with five or more bone metastases or any visceral mets. And they found that overall there was no difference in overall survival or um, failure free survival. But in the patients with low burden disease, there was an improvement in a statistically significant improvement in both overall survival and performance, uh, sorry, um, failure free survival, which is shown in, in the Kaplan Meyer curve. So for low burden disease, uh, compared to high burden disease, there was there was a um, survival benefit, but this was associated often with with the um, toxicities, and actually there was a five percent rate of grade three to four adverse events. So whilst these low burden patients uh, may have survival benefit, you're actually potentially um, causing uh, significant toxicity in someone who who with their low burden disease may actually be pretty asymptomatic. They might be actually doing a lot of harm. So we've already looked at um, alternative fractionations for, uh, for bladder cancer. Uh, in bladder, bladder cancer, they also commonly use 36 and 6. Uh, in breast cancer, there's no real head-to-head -head, uh, trials looking at uh, optimal palliative doses, um, but commonly, um, practices you it is 30 30 gray and five fractions uh, or 36 and six <coughs> and in cns disease with high grade gliomas and patients who are not fit for uh, for radical treatment uh, 30 gray and six um fractions on alternate days over two weeks is a super, is an appropriate and well tolerated alternative to best supportive care so that links into um, whether there's other modalities. So we've already looked at photons. Um, brachytherapy can also provide uh, good palliative uh, relief. So in uh, lung cancer, uh, intraluminal brachytherapy uh, can provide symptom uh, relief for obstructive symptoms of cough, dyspnea, um, but also for hemoptysis. So patients are treated with, um, they, under, they undergo bronchoscopy, um, where tumor length uh, and position is measured. Uh, un and this is done under sedation. And then whilst the patient's still uh, sedated, uh, the HDR catheter is then inserted uh, into the, the same position, delivering HDR brachy in up to, up to 10 gray in a single fraction. And this can be repeated um, several times um, a month apart. Uh, and this actually provides good symptom uh, relief in, in more than two thirds of patients, uh, especially in patients with hemoptysis. Um, but the drawback is it requires uh, bronchoscopy 
and sedation, which might not be appropriate uh, for a lot of lung, lung patients. Um, brachytherapy can also be used in uh, esophageal cancer uh, to relieve dysphagia or, or hemorrhage. And it's a good al alternative to um, palliative stent insertion. So in one trial, um, where they looked at patients with inoperable esophageal cancer with symptomatic dysphagia, they randomized pa patients to either have a stent insertion or a single um, fraction of brachytherapy with 12 gray. They found that um, dysphagia, imp unsurprisingly, improved a lot quicker with stent insertion, uh, but it was much long-lasting uh, in the brachytherapy arm. Um, and there were also much um, fewer complications as well from brachytherapy. So this is definitely an alternative uh, approach to um, certainly photon and stent insertion. So we've already talked about the um, Stampede trial, which, looked, which found benefit for patients with low burden disease. Um, that links into oligometastatic disease. Um, where commonly we're now using uh, SABRE and SRS, uh, stereotactic uh, radio surgery, uh, in managing these patients. So the SABRE COMET trial uh, looked at, it was a phase two trial looking at patients with uh, low volume metastatic disease, so that's less than five METs, uh, and randomized them to either standard of care, which could include um, palliative radiotherapy or systemic treatment or the standard of care with um, Sabre to, to all these, these metastatic lesions. And Sabre doses uh, vary from uh, 30 to 60 gray and up to eight fractions. And for SRS, they would do a single fraction of um, between 16 and, and 24 gray. So they found that um, medial survival, um, although it, it appeared um, appear to be, be different with, uh, with um, 28 um, months in the, in, in the standard arm compared to this, uh, 41 months in the, in the Sabre Sabre group. This actually wasn't statistically significant. Um, there there is, is now a phase three trial recruiting to, to investigate this further. But they did find um, progression-free survival of, of approximately six months, which was statistically significant. So there is um, progression-free survival, so some prognostic value, um, but this is actually at the um, expense of toxicity. So um, there, in the trial, there was actually three, three um, deaths, nearly 5% related to, uh, to Sabre. And then I think we should look at uh, other technologies. So MR Linux um, uses MRI uh, imaging to provide better soft tissue contrast, and that allows, uh, and it also allows for um, adaptive ap approach online um, to um, to optimize the daily daily plans based on changes in uh, in tumor tumor size and location and and um, moving anatomy. Um, but at present, it's really only used in, in radical treatments where, which are already utilizing MRI planning, so prostate and cervix. So the question is, can, will this ever be uh, a role in palliative radiotherapy? So one, one model, the, st the STAT-ART, um, is a model for rapid access uh, clinic using um, MR Linux for, uh, for urgent palliative radiotherapy. There's quite a complicated schematic on the on the right. But basically, they have um, using diagnostic imaging um, before the patient even arrives. They um, they formulate a, a pre-treatment plan uh, that's generated and um, along alongside physics and dis and dosimetry. Um, and then when the patient arrives, um, they have their planning scan with an MRI scan. Um, which actually provides superior uh, bone metastasy visualization and may lead to greater precision and reduced margin. And then that um, that plan is actually adapted um, whilst the patient's actually on the, the treatment couch. 
Um, but this can lead to turnaround times with a patient uh, on the couch of more than 30 minutes, which especially in a, a patient who's frail or um, have um, marked pain, that might not really be, be appropriate. So this isn't, this certainly isn't established practice at the moment. So in summary, high dose palliation um, is appropriate in, in some patients uh, uh, with good prognosis and it does uh, provide, uh, can provide long lasting symptom and um, symptom relief and prognostic values. Um, but this is at the expense of, uh, of more toxicities. So I think careful clinical assessment uh, and patient uh, selection is really essential. Um, but high dose palliation with conventional techniques uh, is still relevant in the majority of patients. Um, so you don't need fancy technology uh, and this, this can really be applied uh, to centers all, all over the world. Uh, and I think lasting message is that hypofractionation works. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Portner and Professor Chowdhury uh, for that overview on uh, high dose uh, palliative radiotherapy. Uh, you can send in your questions through the Q&A tool. Um, while we await questions, we then we will move on to the final block of case discussions and. Uh, it is my privilege to invite uh, Dr. Krishanti Rajasuriya uh, to lead the discussion. So the first case is a 78-year-old lady who presented with progressively enlarging right-sided groin node uh, for 12 months duration. She denied any symptoms related to the reproductive tract or the lower GI tract. On examination, uh, her performance was ECOP2. She was not pale. There were no palpable cervical, axillary, or other lymph nodes. She had chronic lymphedema of the right lower limb, and there were no skin lesions in the lower limb, su suggestive of a potential primary. And abdominal examination was clinically normal, except for a large fungating right groin node measuring eight by five centimeter, which was fixed to deep structures with skin involvement. The vaginal and digital rectal examinations were normal, and rest the rest of the systemic examination was normal. So this is uh, the node. Uh, it's a fungating large node. Uh, and a co biopsy of the groin node uh, revealed metastatic deposits of uh, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, endoscopies of the lower GI tract uh, were, were normal, and the CT scan of the uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis revealed no abnormality except for this large fungating right groin node. Uh, so, the question to the panel is Are blind biopsies of the genital tract and the lower GI tract? indicated in this patient. Um, Naduni, uh, your thoughts on this? Okay, uh, uh, can I ask Professor Chowdhury, do you think uh, blind biopsies are indicated or uh, do we say that uh, imaging Negative imaging is sufficient. So I think it's really important to do a thorough examination um, of the patient and ensure that you know you've, we've looked at the skin areas and done an internal examination and you know been um, clinically um, you know done our clinical investigations. I would not advise blind biopsies of the genital and lower GI tract. This patient has metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, and as such, I would treat her um, in that light. So um, the options to consider here are, you know, systemic treatment, chemotherapy, and localized radiotherapy for palliation where indicated. Okay, uh, Dr. Partner. Would you consider blind biopsies or would you simply uh, go with negative examination? I think that's tough. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't biopsy. Okay. Well, I wouldn't do, do the blind biopsies, no. Okay, so there's a question from the audience. Uh, the place of uh, 
pet PT in this setting? Uh, Professor Haskin, uh, do you think? Um, well, I think um, uh, we've looked at PET CT in carcinoma of unknown primary, and, and it rarely uh, actually adds anything. And um, the sites you're really looking for, which would be genital urinary tract or, or um, anal canal, um, often will not show well on the PET scan, certainly an FDG PET scan, or you'll get false positives. Um, but I, I think I would take a slightly different view to my colleagues. I, I would certainly consider blind biopsies. I mean, <clears throat> you've got a squamous carcinoma in the groin. You've got to ask yourself, where's it come from? It's unlikely that it's come from the lung. Um, so it's most likely it's come from the um, genital tract or from the anal canal. And certainly, I, I think we've all seen um, occult anal carcinomas presenting as um, inguinal node uh, disease. Uh, the importance of finding it, you may question, but I think if you if you identify the primary site, then clearly you'd want to include that in any radiation field you were undertaking, and it might just direct your your if you were giving chemo rads um, your your chemotherapy. Um, obviously, in a 78 year old lady, um, uh, I suspect of limited performance status, you might not be inclined to such radical treatment, but I, I think it would not be inappropriate to do the biopsies. PET scan, I think, probably is not going to show you very much. So we decided to treat a therapy. If so, what dose fractionation given the chronic lymphedema? So I just have put uh, the EQD2s and the BDs of the commonly used palliative doses. So which one would you recommend? Okay, uh, so before that, uh, can I ask uh, Professor Hoskin whether the, you treat this patient uh, palliatively, uh, assuming that all biopsies are negative as well? I don't know. I think if she's, if she's fit, and I know there were some questions about 78-year-olds, but certainly uh, in, in the UK, we would treat a 78-year-old radically if appropriate. Uh, if she has no other comorbidities, um, I think I would be uh, tempted to treat her with a high dose, certainly. Um, yeah. Because if you don't get local control of that groin, you're going to have serious problems and she's going to have a miserable demise. She's going to get more and more lymphedema. She's going to become immobile. And the real worry with these groins, and I have seen it happen, um, is, is as it will erode the femoral artery and she will have a, a, a rapid but very unpleasant death. So I would do all I could to uh, to minimize that possibility. Okay, so thanks. So you with conventional fractionation, prop, but she wasn't the <laughs> Well, I, <clears throat> I, I, I would go for a 15 fraction schedule. Um, I might even be inclined to go for 50 gray because that's a very large lump. Um, but certainly 40 to 50 gray and 15 fractions would be, would be my choice. And would you ever consider brachytherapy? to boost the dose locally? I don't think you cover the whole thing with brachytherapy because you're going deep and then you're, amongst, you're in tiger country amongst all the vessels. And if the tumor doesn't make a hole in the femoral artery, you probably will, or I probably will. Um, so um, I wouldn't, um, I don't think I would go there with brachytherapy, no. <clears throat> if this patient was young and fit, uh, what would be the best treatment? So. Like even if we decide on external beam radiotherapy, uh, to what level do we treat? Uh, do we treat only the external iliacs, or do we treat both common up to common iliac? What would be the best approach? Do you think? Yeah. Well, well, I have treated these as um, uh, as anal cancers and um, treated them as a radical anal anal uh, schedule, uh, treating both groins and and the uh, the lower pelvis. Can I move on to the next case? Yeah, just one more question. Uh, so that is if, if the patient is fit, Prof, you'd uh, treat it as anal cancer or even... Uh, oh, yes. It says young and fit. Yeah, yeah, right. okay. I was reading the, reading the slide for once. <laughs> okay, right. uh, so in the... In the yeah, uh, no, if they're for full performance status, then I would just aim uh, just, just to focus on the, the, on the groin, of course. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so we treated her with 14, 15, and uh, this was my field arrangement with bolus. Okay, so uh, just uh, 
Just a bit, Krishant. So, is there agreement on the? Would you treat this conformally or uh, fourteen, fifteen? How about the good old anterior posterior weighted beam, uh, or would you just go with a, a conformal arrangement like this? Um, uh, Doctor Partner, any thoughts on this? Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, yeah. I'm. I, I think either either reasonable depends on her fitness. Really. Um, it is. I, I think it's quite important actually to treat like this, um, because um, you want to avoid toxicity as well. And you can see there the volume is quite close to the um, to the anal canal and, and lower rectum, and presumably higher up to the bladder. And, and you don't want this lady having a lot of uh, nasty bowel and bladder side effects. So I think this is absolutely the right way forward. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the second case is a 35-year-old gentleman who was investigated for swelling over the maxillary region that was four years ago in 2016 uh, and in another hospital. The biopsy revealed a spindle cell tumor with occasional mitosis. The preliminary uh, immunohistic chemistry showed positivity for PAN-CK and S100 and negativity for SMA. Uh, further immunos have been done, but unfortunately the patient has misplaced the report. Uh, the query the pathologist ha had was whether it was a synovial sarcoma. He has undergone a mechanical aortic valve replacement in 2019 and was on warfarin. Uh, and he was again treated in Palambo using IMRT technique. Unfortunately, the planned dose was not mentioned, but uh, according to the uh, available details, it said treatment discontinued after 10 fractions due to bleeding. So I'm not quite sure why he bled after. Uh, 10 fractions, whether it was due to problems with INR, but uh, we couldn't find the records. And then he was referred back to the local hospital for uh, palliative care. Uh, so he developed a swelling in the upper lip, which was slowly progressive, and he had gradually become bedridden, but we do not know the reason for that. And uh, there was oozing from this tumor, which was uh, dripping into his mouth, and he had to swallow the discharge. And therefore, he decided to have some palliative treatment for uh, symptom control. So he came to our unit in October 2019, and we did a restaging CT scan, which had a right maxillary enteral tumor infiltrating the inferior turbinate of the nasal cavity and the upper lip, but he did not have any distant metastasis. He had, a, he had bilateral pubic remi fractures, but they were not suggestive of pathological fractures, uh, and he denied any history of trauma. And this was the tumor. Um, and the CT, uh, the coronal, the axial, and the sagittal views. And how would you treat this patient? Is it high dose palliation or low dose palliation? If high dose, what dose and what technique? Okay, so can we have some responses from the audience on this? Uh, and. Uh... Uh, Naduni, uh, what you're around? What what's your th what are your thoughts on this? Uh? So, uh, um, for me, um, the major issue is why is he performance state of three dead bound now? But I would like to sort of get to know what. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question, Naduni. Okay, uh, so there is one response from the audience. Uh, it's high dose palliation. Uh, and what dose then? Other say because high dose palliation. Oh. Yes, I think yeah. go to that. Yeah. So the audience seems to say uh, high dose palliation. Uh, there is another <laughs> response saying oh. pot shot. Uh, so, yeah. So we couldn't offer him cord shot because uh, he was from Trincomalee, which is about 250 kilometers away from Jaffna. Uh, so we just used a simple technique uh, 
uh, two laterals and one anterior. Uh, and I use 55 grain, sorry, 22 fractions. Any comments on that? Okay, uh, Dr. Portner, I think, uh, do you see uh, many advanced cases like this in Manchester in your clinic or? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, well, if you did happen to see, uh, what would you, uh, uh, how, many, how would you? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the, what? Uh, no, if you did happen to see this patient in Manchester, uh, in your clinic, I'm asking you, uh, how would you go with the high dose palliation? Yeah, well, I, um, I, I think, I think his performance status, uh, even though he's he's very young, thirty five, um, yeah, thirty nine, yeah, yeah, yeah. But his he doesn't sound very very fit um, for for high dose. So I'd offer a shorter shorter regime, maybe even alternate days, thirty six okay. and six. So which I see in neck. How about some? Uh... Palliative chemo first to downstage this, and then, given that it's a it's a, it's a large tumor, or how would you just... rapid tumor because the mortality count was so low, and it was it kind of, uh, so therefore we didn't think of chemo, and he was not willing for chemo. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, the audience agrees with the high dose uh, palliation. Uh, uh, there are some schedules. Uh, 40 gray in 10 fraction, that's probably the cord shot, I think, uh, or what was given. 40 in 10. Professor Chowdhury, I think in uh, the UK, you used to give 20 gray in 5, uh, followed by a break, and then 20 gray in 5. Is that, you yeah. think? Yeah, so, um, so Dr. Portner covered the um, that schedule in, yeah. in his talk. Um, we used, we give split course, um, a high dose palliative, so 20 in 5 reassess after two weeks if they're they've tolerated it well they're okay then we give another 20 and 5 if necessary coming off the cord um using parallel opposed back in the good old days i guess now it would be perfectly reasonable to ct plan that treatment um up front so you're giving both phases and um use 3d conformal radiotherapy So uh, another audience response that says uh, 36 in six, probably, uh, yeah, 36 six in six weeks, so weekly uh, six gray. Uh, yeah. Let, let, let me move on to the next case. So this is a 68-year-old gentleman who presented with backache for seven months, difficulty in walking for four months, and a single episode of hematuria. On examination, he was ECOG 2 to 3, cachectic, wheelchair bound, and had large palpable bony lumps in the pelvis. Uh, co biopsy of the bony lesion revealed a clear cell carcinoma deposit. And the CT showed a primary tumor in the left kidney with multiple regional lymph nodes, lymph nodes and multiple bony mets with large deposits in the pelvis. How would you treat? Uh, so it's uh, Professor Chowdhury, uh, it's a very large tube. How would so the important factors here are the fact that this man is um, is a very poor performance status and he has symptoms. So I would treat with um, as um, a single fraction of eight gray. Um, and you could actually even treat hemibody if that was felt to be best once you'd looked at all the imaging. Um, hemibody is a very old technique. I'm not sure if many people use it now, but certainly in selective patients, it can be very effective. But even if not, you know, you can certainly treat um, a large part of the pelvis and if necessary, um, incorporate the primary in a field of that size. Professor Hoskin, uh, um, do you use uh, hemibody radiotherapy in your practice? And... Yes, I mean, I mean, it is very difficult. We certainly give hemibody 
um, I, I, I wouldn't worry about the primary in this case. I think that's irrelevant to, to, to the poor patient's symptoms. Um, but certainly a, a whole pelvis, um, because he has at least, what, three metastases there. Um, I would include all those in one field, certainly. Um, and I think in this setting, eight gray is, is perfectly reasonable. Um, he's clearly not fit for fractionated treatment. Um, clearly his prognosis is very poor. Um, and um, I think eight gray might improve his pain and allow him just to return home and be comfortable. Okay, so there are some comments from the audience. Uh, there's one who says sunitinib, uh, and another question is uh, from the audience: Is it's renal cell carcinoma? Uh, it's radio resistant, uh, so high dose RT is queried. Uh, so, uh, Prof. Foskin, do you think uh, this patient uh, would you go with systemic therapy first here, or? <clears throat> well, I, I wondered, but I, I was just then going back to the patient. He's he's quite elderly. He's got poor performance status. Um, I don't think <clears throat> don't think well. Sunitinib is not that effective anyway, to be honest. Yeah. And I, I think that would be a waste of time. I have some very keen medical oncology colleagues who would consider him for, for immunotherapy, but again, I think he may well not be fit enough for that. Um, I think there is an issue. Um, that is often perpetuated in the literature about renal cancers needing higher doses. Um, and that's largely based on one retrospective series. Uh, and I don't think it's really strongly correlated. And again, it depends what you're trying to achieve for this patient. I think you have you look at that extent of bone disease and that there's no way you are ever going to eradicate it. So you're really looking at disease control and, and more importantly, symptom control. And I think, therefore, single doses are more than adequate for, for, for symptom control. If this was an isolated solitary uh, lytic metastasis, then yes, I would agree, and we would consider that as an oligometastasis for, for high-dose uh, stereotactic treatment. Okay. But in this setting, it's, it's totally different, and you're really in a palliative, uh, palliative mode for this. And I think systemic treatment, he probably would not tolerate. So would you treat... Uh... It's just a general question, not necessarily uh, on this patient. Uh, would you treat uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, with higher palliative doses than other tumors, or, or, uh, or is, it, is it all the same? I, I wouldn't treat it with higher doses palliatively, um, except in the setting of oligometastasis, when we would be looking at uh, an ablative dose. Okay. Uh, but in the setting of multiple metastasis and palliation, no. And I don't think there's any evidence for using higher doses, you know, in the stereotactic setting either, because it's renal cell. No, although you're using high doses anyway, so yeah. it's so it's, it's um. So, so the renal cell adequate. doesn't make a difference. Yeah. No. So the radio resistance of uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, is uh, something propagated. Uh, it's more than it's based more on myth than science. Is it fair to say that? I think it's dogma. Okay. Well, it may be based on on, a, on some, you know, giving 40 gray and 20 fractions or something of that sort. And I would agree that's probably not terribly helpful. But I think now with more modern techniques and, and focused treatment and, and big doses per fraction, it's, 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 a, it's a totally different scene. And I don't think it then differs from anything else. Okay. So we just treated with uh, APPA anthroposterior fields to 20 gray in five fractions. And he responded quite well. And then started him on serafinib, initially 200 BD and then 400 BD. And uh, uh, I saw him last on the 9th of November. It's almost one year after diagnosis. And now he's able to walk without support. I think it's a miracle. Okay. Uh, there's another question from the audience. A, re uh, a renal cell CA deposit uh, in the first vertebra. I'm assuming it's the first thoracic vertebra. With... Oh, it doesn't mention the site. Anyway, uh, a vertebral deposit of a renal cell carcinoma with a large soft tissue component. Do you advocate single dose? Um, is that to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I well, so so it depends on the setting. If that's a if that's a solitary metastasis, which okay. in renal cancer it certainly can be. Okay, so then uh, I would be looking to a surgeon first of all, um, and. 
if it was not considered operable, I would be offering stereotactic radiotherapy um, to, a, to an ablative dose. Yeah, so we've, uh, she's replied, it's first cervical vertebra. Does that make a difference? No, it, um, it, it means I perhaps go to a neurosurgeon rather than, than an orthopedic surgeon. Um, but apart <laughs> from that, I don't, think, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it would alter the actual treatment. If we came to radiotherapy, then um, I, I think it strengthens the case for doing something moderately sophisticated with, with a stereotactic uh, approach, but I don't think otherwise it would. Okay, thanks. Over to you. So the fourth case is a 50-year-old lady who was diagnosed of T3 and not M0 grade 3, triple negative left breast cancer in December 2016. She underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by wide local excision and axillary clearance and uh, radiotherapy to the breast and ACF 40 gray in 15 fractions. She developed an ipsilateral recurrence 18 months after the diagnosis and underwent mastectomy and histology revealed a 68 millimeter recurrent tumor. Clear margins, the deep margin was 20 millimeter, triple negative with a T67 of 90%. Uh, she developed local recurrence within three months, which was unresectable and offered chemotherapy and radiation, again using 20 grain five fractions with electrons. Uh, however, the local disease to uh, progress without distant metastasis, giving rise to profuse offensive discharge. And this is the lesion. Will you re-treat this patient? Because she was chemo resistant, she had multiple lines of chemotherapy and nothing worked. Uh, and will you give any more radiation to this patient or just palliative care? So this is uh, a chemo resistant uh, tumor which recurs locally. You can say it's radio resistant as well because uh, after adjuvant radiotherapy and uh, further radiotherapy. Uh, so uh, could we have some responses from the audience? Yeah, there is one who says uh, palliation. Uh, so uh, Dr. Portner, uh, again, uh, you obviously wouldn't be seeing such cases in Manchester, but uh, how would you treat? I mean, not as aggressive as this, but uh, local recurrence uh, after chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh local recurrence alone which is yeah. uh, inoperable uh how would you approach it i mean it's going to be a huge field to treat palliatively anyway so i'd just because it, i'd still probably plan this conformally anyway because it's going to be an extent, extent of disease but with a palliative dose okay. and i'd fractionate that uh, right, we've had some responses from the audience. Uh, most say uh, palliative care only. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Kondo Singh is on, uh, online as well, so can we ask for, as a, a palliative care physician? Uh, now, this is something we talked about how uh, palliative care physicians can help radiation oncologists. And here, the radiation oncologists are going to refer this patient to you. Yeah, in, in my setting, of course, like uh, the what they do is they will refer to us. Uh, but unfortunately, in Sri Lankan setting, still, it becomes your problem, I suppose, yeah. because you don't have the, the palliative care physician uh, or, uh, to treat this kind of situation. Um, let me go back to not only this patient, I think uh, Dr. Nandini's previous patient who had the breast cancer as well, uh, the, both of them, like uh, they were quite close to those, the neurological pain syndrome. So um, the make sure that uh, you are covering this patient with good neurological and neuropathic pain cover for these patients. Um, uh, these are the patients who will sometimes do have a lot of opioid resistant uh, resistant pain. Um, that I know availability is limited in uh, Sri Lanka, but uh, these patients will sometimes benefit from methadone. Uh, these are the patients who have like because that's uh, regardless of the major nerve involvement, a lot of neurological involvement in the skin level as well. 
So most of them, uh, I have a similar patient at the moment um, who was referred by our, one of the friendly uh, radiation oncologists. Uh, he's on three types of neuropathic pain agents because none of the opioids are touching the pain. Um, so, um, and we can intoxicate the people with uh, uh, opioids, uh, go up and up, uh, but without any pain relief. The, most of the time, these kind of patients, they will go to opioid reduce hyperagesia as well because you we push the pain relief quite quickly um, uh, because we don't see the response. And uh, my only uh, advice is basically think about other than opioids something to because something to add for that adjuvant in this setting. Uh, don't just rely on opioids in these patients. Um, um, that is. Um, uh, like to go with this patient. I think uh, Dr. Krishanti's previous patient with the head and neck cancer, I just wanted to up um, the one who had a lot of secretions. The make sure these patients, the secretions are, because your treatment can take some time to work. So during that time, patients get fed up with the secretions all the time. Things like glycopyrrolate and uh, other symptomatic measures are added. Um, and I know glycopyrrolate is limited availability in Sri Lanka, but uh, uh, anesthetists keep that in theaters, uh, so you can use that. Um, or like simple measures like atropine drops to dry out situations. Okay, thanks, Dr. Okay. Thanks. Um, Prashanti. Uh, um, and the last case, a 76-year-old gentleman presented with a large ulcer on the right cheek uh, for one year duration, and he had difficulty in eating due to a malignant fistula. On examination, there was a large necrotic ulcer with a large fistula with lots of maggots in it. So this is the lesion, and these are the maggots from the lesion. How would you treat? Will you offer radiation and make the fistula worse, or you just send in for palkia? Okay, uh, right, so whom do I ask this? Uh, Naduni, uh, your thoughts on this? Okay, we have some responses. Uh, oh, we have some responses from the audience. Uh, single agent Tuximab, uh, symptomatic care, eight grace single dose. Uh, uh, palliative care and palliative care. Uh, so, Nadani, would you consider uh, cetuximab in this in this patient? Okay, um, Professor Huskin, uh, do you think uh, would you just would you treat this patient with radiotherapy uh, at all, or would you just send this patient for palliative care? I think. I think I would just send this patient for palliative care. I don't know what radiotherapy is going to achieve. Um, if he was bleeding, uh, then I might consider radiotherapy for, for control of bleeding. Um, but otherwise, I think it's just going to make a, a bigger hole. Um, so I would, um, I would be certainly caring for him with palliative care physicians and not um, putting radiotherapy forward as, as the main treatment. Dr. Portner, uh, I know that in the UK, uh, cetuximab is used uh, in this setting, I mean, for inoperable head and neck cancer recurrences. Uh, do you think, uh, any thoughts on this? Or would you just uh, send this patient? Yeah, so we, well, we don't, we don't use it so much as just as single agent. Um, I don't think this, is he? He's probably not going to be fit for systemic treatment, though. Oh, see, right. So I think, uh, yeah, majority of the audience agrees with supportive care. Uh, again, can I go to uh, Dr. Kondasinghe? Uh, your radiation oncology colleagues have again referred this patient <laughs> to you. So, uh, from a palliative care physician, yes, uh, I mean, we see this is uh, just to a uh, bit of context. We see uh, this this scenario is not uncommon in Sri Lanka. We have lots of hedonic patients uh, come with unsalvageable recurrence 
Uh, so what are your thoughts as a palliative care physician? Uh, how would you approach uh, this patient? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it is not uncommon in India, in Australia as well. Some some of the heavy smokers, uh, especially our prison population, I see this quite commonly. Um, yeah, so as Prof. Hoskin said, mentioned, like a bleeding benefit will be the only thing uh, I can see in this setting. But uh, even if that is the case, like uh, rather than this patient going through that, I I rather use. Some, some kind of systemic therapy to stop the bleeding, basically. Um, the, we can easily use tranexamic acid or any other medications in that setting to stop the bleeding. Uh, if that bleeding is, uh, it, the, the, is troublesome, um, uh, uh, and uh, that, uh, that's, that's where we are, we are very happy to look after these kind of patients and support these things. Uh, unfortunately, I have seen so many patients smoking through that hole as well. Uh, the, so the, they will not stop that uh, smoking habit sometimes. And uh, yeah, so we, we, will, we will support these patients and uh, of course bleeding can be uh, controlled with other measures. Okay, right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Kondasinga. There's a comment uh, from the audience. I hope the foreign speakers are not too stressed to see these advanced cases. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it would take uh, quite a lot to put uh, Professor Huskin and Professor Chowdhury under stress. Uh, it takes more more than advanced cases. So, um, right, I think uh, so. We've reached the end of this case discussion, and uh, also uh, the end of this, the workshop. And I, on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Oncology, I want to thank our distinguished faculty, Professor Peter Huskin and Professor Chowdhury, as well as Dr. Portner from the United Kingdom. Thank you for waking up early on a Friday morning and for staying throughout the session. Thank you to also uh, Dr. Kondasinga Singh for staying up late and to our two local speakers, uh, Dr. Krishanti Rajasuriya and Dr. Nadu Nimbulgara. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, we will wrap up this session. Uh, the annual academic sessions will proceed tomorrow and the day after as well. And also we have a number of teaching capsules on the conference website, as well as uh, several oral presentations and poster presentations. So we hope you would uh, make full use of this. And I want to thank uh, our IT team, uh, as well as the media team. And uh, so for all the delegates, uh, hope to see you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.